So the recording is live. All right. Uh, so uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, I want to start uh, by thanking David Umansky and congratulating him on putting together what is going to be a fabulous symposium. You have allowed us today to go where no other Albany Law Review Symposium has gone before, into outer space. Krista McAuliffe, the social studies teacher and astronaut who lost her life on the Challenger Space Shuttle said, space is for everybody. It's not just for a few people in science or math or for, for a select group of astronauts. That's our new frontier out there. And it's everybody's business to know about space. Space is for everybody. It's easy to lose track of that idea when we predominantly see only countries and billionaires building rocket ships. It took only 56 years to go from the Wright brothers' first flight at Kitty Hawk to Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon. Yet here we are 65 years later and still only about 600 people have traveled in space. However, that number is growing rapidly and it's not hard to imagine a time in the relatively near future where not only is space travel common, but we could see people living and working off planet. Jeff Bezos even announced recently that he has plans to build a business park in space. Seems like a tough commute, but let's see how that works out. The legal issues surrounding space travel have been considered for almost as long as the concept of space travel itself. In 1967, more than 100 nations signed the Outer Space Treaty. That was only 10 years after Sputnik. The treaty, often called the Magna Carta of space, tackled issues such as nuclear weapons in space and what countries can or can't do on the moon. However, it only really began to scratch the surface of the myriad legal issues that we'll likely face as we continue to expand private and public usage of space. We're now being asked to consider how the laws that currently govern us on this planet would apply when we begin to colonize new ones. As lawyers, we will be an integral part of shaping the next stage of space travel. We have an opportunity to create an equitable and fair future and fulfill McAuliffe's vision of ensuring that space is for everybody. David Amansky and the Law Review team have assembled an amazing panel to be our celestial guides as we explore tonight's incredibly interesting, important, and timely topic. I want to thank the Albany Law Review for bringing all of these folks together, and I want to thank every one of our panelists in advance for what I know will be enlightening and inspiring comments. So thank you very much and congratulations, David and uh, the Law Review and Editor-in-Chief, Tori Deo. Hello everyone and welcome to Albany Law Review's Fall Symposium. My name is Tori Deo and I am Albany Law Review's Volume 85 Editor-in-Chief. I want to start by thanking you all for taking the time to come and support Albany Law Review. We are extremely pleased to see so many people from across the world and nation who are interested in joining in on this conversation. We truly appreciate you all taking a few hours out of your Thursday night to be with us tonight. We're confident that tonight's conversation regarding the new space race and the legal implications will be thought provoking and informative. Before I introduce Albany Law Review's executive editor for Symposium, Mr. David Umansky, I would like to take a minute to speak about Albany Law Review. As you all are aware, this symposium is being hosted by Albany Law Review. We are one of Albany Law School's three law review journals. Albany Law Review was founded in 1936 and is the successor of the Albany Law School Journal, the first student edited legal periodical in the United States. We are an independent student-run journal with about 50 student editors who work weekly and tirelessly to edit our articles that fill our four issues, including New York appeals, state constitutional commentary, and miscarriages of justice. Albany Law Review's editors solicit critical and meaningful legal articles from practitioners, professors, lawyers, judges, and other legal scholars from across the nation. I would like to now 
I would like to now introduce Albany Law Review's executive editor for Symposium, Mr. David Umansky. David has been planning this symposium since May. He has spent hours coordinating and reaching out to all the legal minds in the space field. We are extremely fortunate to have our panelists tonight and without David, this would be impossible. David, I appreciate your passion for this topic and how hard you have worked. Thank you. On that note, I would like to turn it over to David Umansky. Thank you, Tori. And a warm welcome to all of you to Albany Law Review's Volume 85 Symposium, The Law and Space, Challenges of the New Space Race. Thank you for joining us, especially those of you joining us from different time zones. Before we get started, as a general rule, you may utilize the chat function throughout the entire event to discuss topics that our moderator and panelists will be speaking about. As a note, they will not be monitoring the chat, but my co-host and I will be. If any questions come up in either the chat or question box, we will make note of them, and towards the end of the event, we will ask them to our panelists. We only ask that you interact in a professional manner and be respectful of our speakers and differing ideas. On that note, let me introduce our incredible moderator. Our moderator for this evening is Professor Alexandra Harrington. Professor Harrington holds her doctoral degree in law from McGill University Faculty of Law and her JD and LLM from Albany Law School. She is the founder and executive director of the Center for Global Governance and Emerging Law, research director for the Center of International Sustainable Development Law, and vice chair of the Board of Women in Ethics and Compliance Global. She is the author of several books, International Organizations and the Law, as well as International Law and Global Governance, Treaty Regimes and Sustainable Development Goals Interpretation. Her latest book, Just Transition and the Future of Law and Regulation, will be available in 2022. Professor Harrington has served as a Fulbright Canada Special Foundation Fellow at the Balsillie School of International Affairs in Waterloo and was the 2018-2019 Fulbright Canada Research Chair in Global Governance. She has served as a consultant for entities such as the United Nations Framework on Climate Change, and her journal publications address a variety of fields relating to international law, including international organizations, governance issues, environmental law, legal issues relating to climate change, international child rights, natural research regulation, international human rights law, international trade law, corporate social responsibility, and criminal law, to just name a few. The event would not have been possible if not for her guidance and expertise. We are so excited for her to join us today. Um, now, I will turn over the rest of the event to Professor Harrington. Thank you. David, thank you so much. And I don't think I can live up to that introduction. Um, and I should apologize in advance lest there be any odd noise coming from outside here. I am currently in Edinburgh um, for the Climate Change Convention. And um, while my hotel room is lovely, it's a bit loud outside. So celebrating, you know, 20 some year olds near pubs, that's why. Anyway, welcome this evening. And I really would just be remiss if I didn't start off by saying to David that you have done such an amazing job. And he literally sat in my office when he was first picked to run the symposium, which was a brilliant inspired choice and said that he wanted to do a symposium on space. And, you know, but has just constructed this amazing event. So David, we thank you for this. And we thank all of our panelists, some of whom I have just met, some of whom I have known for longer than I care to admit, um, you know, who's aged me, not them, but me. Anyway, um, but it will be a lovely evening. And I do hope that by the end, um, even those of you who are not that familiar with space will come to really understand the, the many potential impacts and the many existing impacts that space has on our daily lives, on the way we live our lives, on the way we will live our lives, um, and the way we conceive of law and regulation as we move forward, both post-pandemic and then onwards. Um, and often a lot of these discussions have been kind of lost in the pandemic discussion or lost in the sensationalism of um, space tourism or the idea of Jeff Bezos um, spending large amounts of money to travel. Um, but we don't really think about these critical issues from a legal perspective. So David, you have brought together an excellent panel for this. And what I would like to do just briefly um, for those, especially students who are joining us, who don't have much of a background in space law, is just to provide a brief 
few minute overview of the five core treaties that exist so that as our speakers are presenting and as we're having our conversations, you can feel a bit more um, aware of what the background is legally and also able to ask questions or, or have any points that might come up that you would wish to raise added into the chat. Um, please do bear in mind that in addition to the international laws that we talk about, um, our speakers will certainly be addressing some of the national laws and that while we have international law and space, we're also increasingly seeing national laws focusing on space programs and policies, including countries that we as especially American audiences um, might not necessarily think of as being involved in space itself, but are actually quite involved, quite heavily involved and are charting new paths. For example, Nigeria and also Egypt um, are doing incredible work, to name only a few, and many Latin American countries are as well. Um, so it is important to remember that these international pieces are part of a much larger whole of national legislation. Um, Dean Willett had referenced the 1966 Outer Space Treaty, um, which has the perhaps much more elegant title that includes uh, regulating the moon and other celestial bodies. Um, however, what it, it does in a nutshell, what it does is define for the first time the idea that space is uh, what we call res communis. And res communis in international law is considered to be a territory or an entity that belongs to everyone. Um, thus, it can belong to no state because it belongs to everyone, to all mankind. Um, so when we think about common examples in international law on Earth, we often think about the high seas and international waters, which are considered to be res communis, as well as the polar regions, which at least in theory are, although in practice are subject to several other jurisdictional claims. Um, this means that as a corollary, the Outer Space Treaty provides that we will not have states making claims to any type of sovereignty over celestial bodies, be it the moon or otherwise. And we do know that this is obviously something that is changing over time and over rhetoric. Um, the, the rest of the provisions in the OST relate to issues such as not uh, carrying out nuclear weapons testing um, and, and the provision of basic aid and uh, support to astronauts, uh, regardless of nationality, when they are in a potential issue of peril, a situation of peril, um, as well as the launching of various types of entities into outer space. And so we do see here that in 1966, this was obviously very much influenced by the Cold War. And uh, the language very much had a great deal of concern reflecting Cold War um, politics and Cold War ideology. This is also very much reflected in the other agreements that we do have, such as the agreement on the rescue of astronauts, the return of astronauts, and the return of objects launched into outer space, which again happened in 1967 the Convention on International Liability for Damage Caused by Space Objects, which was from 1971, um, and was one of the first efforts to really establish that, yes, as we are active in space, there is the potential, indeed the reality, of, uh, of having liability incurred for various types of what we would consider to be torts or accidental happenings um, in that context and how this might be handled. Uh, the 1974 Convention on Registration of Objects Launched into Outer Space actually requires some type of overall uh, registry so that we understand what is going on and what is going up, uh, I should say, um, a bit more protectively than, uh, than we have in the past. And finally, um, last but certainly in no ways least, the agreement governing the activities of states on the moon and other celestial bodies itself, as I mentioned, um, elaborates many elements um, from the Outer Space Treaty and from other agreements and um, provides us with what we consider to be the fifth element of these discussions. Um, but that is all you need to hear from me because you can hear from me at any point in time, um, especially those of you who are students. But what we really want to do is now that we have a background, um, hand over to our wonderful speakers. So um, what we will do, I will introduce them first, and then we will go in the order in which they are introduced. Um, and I, I will happily at any point, um, if I, we need any technical assistance, assist as needed. But our first speaker is Professor Dr. Tiniebi Aganaba, uh, who is Assistant Professor at the School for the Future of Innovation in Society 
and also courtesy, holds a courtesy appointment at the Sandra Day O'Connor College at Arizona State University. Um, she is an assistant professor of space and society and um, was a postdoctoral fellow and uh, fellow at the Center for International Governance and in, in, pardon me, Innovation uh, in Waterloo, Ontario, also in Canada, uh, where she focused on environmental governance. And I should say that Timmy has been a very close friend for a very long time, so I'm very honored that she and Duncan are, are joining us this evening, since we were all at McGill together. Um, she was executive director of World Space, the World, World Space Week Association, coordinating the global response to the United Nations 1999 declaration that World Space Week should be celebrated annually from October 4th to 10th each year. She is currently on the advisory board for the Space Generation Advisory Council, supporting the UN program on space applications, and is on the science advisory board of Worldview Enterprises and the SETI Institute. Other positions she has held include four years as a space industry consultant for leading space analyst firms in Montreal, uh, where she led a pipeline of commercialization studies for the Canadian Space Agency and led the socioeconomic aspects of uh, the socioeconomic assessment of Canadian space sector policies. Uh, in addition, she has taught in France and as associate chair uh, in Ireland for of the Space Policy Law and Economics Department at the International Space University and was an associate at Coyote, Safola, and Associates Law Firm. Um, so that is our first speaker, uh, Professor Aganaba. Professor Stephen Wood, our second speaker, is Associate Director for Innovation and Entrepreneurship of the State University of New York Research Foundation. He is the Associate Director um, and provides IP management and technology commercialization services to the more than 25 SUNY campus locations throughout New York State, uh, including SUNY Upstate Medical Center, SUNY Albany, and Polytechnic Institute. Previously, he was with the US Patent and Trademark Office as a patent examiner in the multiplexing art unit, where he took and passed the US patent bar and became a licensed US patent attorney. Following this, he worked with the US Department of Energy, Brookhaven National Laboratory, where he was a licensing associate in the Office of Technology Commercialization and Partnerships. In addition, he holds an advanced degree in LLM um, at the International Institute of Air and Space Law in Leiden in the Netherlands, where he also worked in technology commercialization at the Leiden University Office of Research and Innovation Services. He has worked uh, in various startup corporations and also um, with various international entities that have consulted and worked with the, the European Union itself. He has received his bachelor's degree with honors from Hamilton College and graduated from Syracuse University College of Law and College of Engineering and Computer Science with a dual JD MS EE degree. Um, and is where he conducted his master's thesis on generating non-differentiating Right, pardon me, diffracting. This is what happens when you ask a lawyer to read these things. Uh, non dispersive laser pulses using nonlinear metamaterials for long haul space comms applications. Our third speaker is Professor Duncan Blake, who joins us from Australia at a very hour, early hour of the morning. Um, Professor Blake is at the University of New South Wales, Canberra, um, and at the Australian Defence Force Academy. He transferred from the permanent Air Force to the reserves in January of 2017 after spending 22 years as a legal officer in the Royal Australian Air Force. He worked at the tactical, operational, and strategic levels at home and on deployment overseas, and was deployed on several operational tours providing legal support to ADF operations in the Middle East in 2003, 2009, and 2016. He has contributed extensively to doctrine and policy for defense and whole of government on issues of operations law and space law, and has founded and chaired interdepartmental and international working groups on space law, especially in military and strategic contexts. He has an undergraduate degree in law and economics, as well as a master's of law degree by coursework from the University of Melbourne, and a master's of law by research from McGill University. He is also a graduate of Australian Command and Staff College. His master's thesis, 
thesis topic at McGill University, which I remember well, was on the need for a manual on international law applicable to warfare in space. He also has been a member of the Australian uh, pardon me, Advisory Council uh, to the Space Industry Association of Australia and has been the space law advisor for several areas within the Department of Defense in Australia. Our fourth speaker, Mr. Mike Gold, is the Executive Vice President for Civil Space and External Affairs at Redwire Space. Mr. Gold is the Executive Vice President for Civil Space and External Affairs and in this capacity supports his company's business development efforts as well as government and media relations. Prior to joining Redwire Space, he was NASA's Associate Administrator for Space Policy and Partnerships and also served as an Acting Associate Administrator for the Office of International and Interagency Relations. Prior to joining NASA, he served as Vice President of Civil Space at MAXAR Technologies and General Counsel for the company's Radiant Solutions Business Unit. He has also spent 13 years at Bigelow Aerospace, where he established the company's Washington office, oversaw the launches of Genesis 1 and 2 spacecrafts, and was a recipient of a NASA Group Achievement Award for his role in the development and deployment of the Bigelow Expanding, pardon me, Expandable Activity Module, BEAM, on the International Space Station. He has authored three law review articles on the topics of commercial space and export control reform, and has testified several times before the US House of Representatives and the US Senate as a commercial space expert. He graduated from the University of Pennsylvania School of Law and is admitted to practice in the District of Columbia and New York State. And finally, our last speaker, and we are so very grateful to have her, is Ms. Sumara Thompson-King who serves as general counsel at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. She was selected as general counsel in June of 2014 and serves as the chief legal officer for the agency, overseeing its team of attorneys responsible for all aspects of NASA's legal affairs around the world. Previously, Ms. Thompson King served as the director I mean, the deputy general counsel responsible for the oversight of substance, substantive legal advice and assistance provided by NASA's associate general counsels to the centers through effective collaboration with the center's chief counsel. She also served as the agency's suspension and disbarment official. Ms. Thompson King began her NASA career in 1986 when she joined the office of chief counsel at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. At Goddard, she provided advice on federal acquisitions, tort law, personnel actions, and the Freedom of Information Act requests received by the agency. I could go on and on for a very long time about her many accomplishments, um, but we'll say that she frequently provides her expertise and knowledge to um, a number of audiences and government activities and agencies. She received her AB in government from Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, and learned, has uh, earned her JD from Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, DC. She is also a member of the Pennsylvania Bar. So now that we know our speakers, it is a pleasure to hand over to them. And um, our first speaker again will be Professor Dr. Aganaba. Wow, what an introduction of such an amazing panel of speakers. I'm just blown away to be in this company. And, you know, just three years as a professor, I'm kind of the newbie here. So I'm going to talk to you guys as like one of you and really think about, you know, what is really going on in the space world? Why is it something that everyone should care about right now? And I think it's really interesting because I started my career 15 years ago, actually at the Nigerian Space Agency. So when you graduate from university in Nigeria, um, I first of all did a degree in the UK where I was born and then I went to law school in Nigeria. You have to do a year's service for the government. And basically you have to work somewhere for one year to serve your country. And I was posted as the first hire in legal affairs and international cooperation. You know, I was 24 years old, you know, you get there. I didn't know anything about space. When I was 15 years old, I did take a trip to NASA, but I was a miserable teenager. So I was there like bored, 
and just like, I don't want to be here. I don't care about this. It doesn't mean anything to me. And when I got to the Nigerian Space Agency, it was really strange because when I told people I worked for the Nigerian Space Agency, the first reaction people would have is, of course, we don't even have electricity or running water in Nigeria, and you guys are talking about space. So right from the very beginning, I had to learn to talk about space in a way where it was like, it's not a given that people think that this topic is important or interesting. It's really something that you have to educate people on why they should care about it, because space is an invisible kind of infrastructure, right? It's not something that you originally, that you automatically understand. And it was really interesting um, 13 years later to come to the US and find that with the, even with the NASA's of the world, it's also not a given. You know, you walk down the street, as we've seen in the press with everything that happened over the summer with the billionaires in space. I did a lot of press for like CNN and all this. And the reporters were just asking the same questions like, who cares about this? You know, is it just a billionaire's, you know, like journey? Or is it something that we have to care about? And I think the problem the space community have is really this narrative that, you know, that space is for everyone. And the truth of the matter is I come from a developing country space program. So of course I'm gonna say space is for everyone, but space tourism doesn't have to be something that everyone cares about. And, and even though for me, who, somebody who's been watching space activities and space tourism, you know, the activities of Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson, they've spent 20 years trying to develop this. So I see it as a technological revolution and something super interesting for humanity and society. But I completely understand when people say, I think you already said, like Prince William said, we have so many pressing and important issues. How do we think about these things holistically? It's not a case of one versus the other. So it's not like, you know, like I always said in Nigeria, you can't say we're gonna solve poverty first before we innovate for the future. You really have to think about the fact that we need to develop things holistically with everyone doing their part to focus on their issues. And when you think of it that way, then of course, why not? Why shouldn't space be something that we're working towards innovating? Now, as a lawyer, what I think is really fascinating having studied international law and gotten into space from, I mean, gotten into law from first of all, a Western perspective in the UK, and then going to law school in Nigeria and understanding law from the perspective of say marginalized communities and more indigenous laws. It's really interesting to see that law is a weapon and is a tool that is used differently by different actors and different stakeholders, right? Like from the perspective that you see law as something that can safeguard you, others can use it as something to push their interests forward. So I think it's really important to understand the power dynamics and the structures around law. And I focus more on governance because I think in the space eras that we've moved through, we're now in the area where maybe law is not exactly the tool that we need. We need to understand the toolbox and what are the different parts of it. So obviously we talk about soft law, we talk about non-binding principles. Since we've had the Artemis Accords, that's an executive, you know, an executive agreement. So what do we actually need to help us move forward? Understanding that back in the 60s, when the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space was established, there were only 24 actors and I think four African countries versus today where we have 20 African countries with space agencies. How do you organize a governance regime when you have that kind of diversity and a country like the US is spending 40, 50 billion dollars on space versus the Philippines who's spending 12 million dollars on the space and they're both calling themselves space countries, right? So, so I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna end it there to say that we're really in these interesting times where we have a diversity of actors at the table and right since the beginning, we've had developing countries, we've had marginalized voices there, but I think some of their concerns were not always held. And today we're at the point where I say we're in the space 5.0, which is the ethics era that says that you can no longer ignore marginalized voices. And now we really have to talk about governance in an inclusive manner, in an inclusive ways that brings all access to the table to ensure that we have this space future that we're dreaming about where everyone can participate. So those are my opening remarks. Thank you, Alexandra. 
Thank you so much, Timmy. Every time I hear from you, it's always fascinating and I always learn some new insights. So thank you very much. Um, our next speaker uh, would be Professor Wood. Thank you, Alexander. <clears throat> um, you know, I, uh, I, I grew up the oldest of uh, six kids, um, you know, small town America, um, not a lot of money. Uh, we actually uh, were granted um, uh, a world book encyclopedia set when I was 11 years old. And I ran through that every article I could find on space. That was, that was really, um, I think the, the inception for me of my passion for space and quasars, you know, the closest stars, Alpha Centauri, Proxima Centauri. And it maybe was growing up in that environment that, that really, you know, kind of made me want to, look outwards but i remember i was 12 years old when i was you know very adamantly telling people i was going to work on a light speed machine so we could get there <laughs> you know so um my my path uh has really always been grounded in science um i i went to undergrad kind of ambivalent between geology and physics um and um uh, the earth sciences and 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 really that that story from Big Bang creation through the evolution of stars and the creation of elements heavier than iron and supernova explosions through the formation of planets and the evolution of life on earth. That was my, my origins of geology class and, and that really grabbed me. So I, I, I just saw an immediate human connection to that um, for, for myself. Um, and physics was a little more abstract and I got beat up in the maths a little bit, but, um, so, so that's what took me into geology. And I, I wound up studying under, um, a, a, a great, uh, a climate scientist. And I actually got to go down to Antarctica in my senior year, National Science Foundation funded, um, expedition to the Antarctic Peninsula. And I, I you know, halfway through my senior year, I just, I got so, I, I was convinced I was going into a master's degree in, in climate science, you know, soft sediments, marine sediments, reconstructing paleoclimates and paleoglaciology. And I got so disillusioned because it was so clear that 99% of the people in my field were saying, hey, we've got a big problem, folks. And, you know, there's a big red light up there and we're just jamming on the gas like there's no tomorrow. So I, you know, why did, why, why, why would I want to go into a field where I'm just going to be, you know, a voice in the wilderness and no one's going to listen. So I, uh, I, I had taken the GREs and everything and, and was looking at programs, but I, I, I threw, threw all that to the side. Uh, I ran off to California and I did a couple years of AmeriCorps um, National Service in, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area working for the Park Service. Um, ultimately, uh, after that, I had read a couple of books, um, uh, The Body Electric by Dr. Robert O. Becker, um, and uh, another book that had uh, gotten really piqued my interest in um, uh, Nikola Tesla. I had gotten interested in the Earth's electromagnetic dynamo and whether it might have any climate um, forcing influences um, near the, the end of my undergrad career. And so, um, with, with that in mind, I came back to the East Coast um, in, in part because my younger siblings were all getting older and getting ready to you know, fly the nest. And I was looking for master's uh, and, and graduate degree, uh, degree programs in electrical engineering. Um, and I found a program that um, actively promoted their dual degree um, with uh, the JD and studying law at Syracuse University. And I had no idea about intellectual property or uh, patents or anything about that beforehand. And I think that is probably true for a, a great many um, science majors uh, and technology majors. Uh, and, I, and I do think we could do a much better job of helping them understand um, how their intellectual contributions um, provide value to um, not only their employers, but you know, uh, society at large and why and how it's important to protect them. Um, but uh, from that, I, I, I wound up in this great program um, looking at technology commercialization, evaluating um, technological solutions, both for internal SU 
uh, clients as well as external clients. Um, and, and when I realized that I was going to have to continually learn new science and technology as a patent attorney, that's, that's what really got me hooked there. Um, and so, um, uh, uh, you know, as uh, uh, Professor Harrington had mentioned, you know, I'd spent some time at the patent office, Brookhaven National Lab. I was looking for what's next um, after uh, my time there. And, and, and that's when uh, I, I, I came back to Leiden University. Um, I had initially discovered them when I was looking for um, uh, PhD programs and dual degree uh, programs. Again, I was looking to possibly continue my studies on these uh, nonlinear, non-diffracting waves. Um, and, and as well, um, I was looking at space law programs and I found McGill and Leiden. Um, and so uh, at that time when my brother uh, let me know he had been admitted to Leiden for a master's of law, public international law, um, uh, that, that jogged my memory. I went back and, and looked it up and I, I found my path from there. So um, uh, yes, I, I got my advanced LLM. Uh, in air and space law from Leiden, use that opportunity to look at the intersection of uh, intellectual property, patent law, and space law. And I've continued down that route uh, ever since. And um, uh, I think uh, it's um, uh, another case um, uh, that was lodged against the US government um, and, uh, and NASA, uh, the uh, Hughes aircraft, uh, versus the U.S. that that really um, uh, kind of demonstrates that that intersection because um, there is this temporary presence defense and under that case these infringing uh, U.K. satellites and one in particular that came in after the revised NASA Act changed the definition of vehicle. Um, that's a whole another story. But uh, it is possible to infringe uh, US patents under this temporary presence defense. And so uh, I'm making it my mission to kind of proselytize a, about this because I think it's uh, a, a risk that not many folks are, are looking at from an investment perspective uh, and from the entrepreneurship and startup perspective. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. That's, that's kind of where I'm at these days. Thank you. It was amazing. It is always so incredible as to how many people have childhood dreams that then come to be reflected in, in being involved in space somehow. It truly really is. So it's a good thing. And it's, you know, encouraging for children to, to dream. I know they can do it. Thank you so much. Um, Duncan, Professor Blake. Thank you. Uh, it really is an honour that there's such an amazing group of people to be um, on a panel with. So I'm very honoured to be part of this panel discussion. I, I want to just quickly talk about my perspective so you know where I'm coming from um, and, and the sorts of questions and things that I would like to talk about. So first, in, first of all, in terms of my perspective, as um, Professor Harrington mentioned, I had 22 years practicing law in a military context. That can be um, quite challenging in, in some circumstances. Uh, military commanders tend to be uh, uh, among the most intolerant of people if you start a discussion about the law with something theoretical. If I, if I said, in, in answer to a question, can we strike this target? And I said something like, um, well, you know, the, the international community of the Red Cross has taken a new approach to, to proportionality and we cut off very quickly. Um, and, and they would say, you know, I, I want a yes or no answer or something like that. So um, I, I would say my, my practice was very much applied law, uh, not theoretical for 22 years. I needed to be short. Uh, I remember doing a being asked to do a presentation to, to a group of fighter pilots. They, they said a week before you've got an hour. Um, then they said uh, two days before, can you do it in half an hour? And then when I got there, that somebody else had taken up some time. They said, oh, can you put it into 10 minutes? Um, so, you know, I, I did what I could. But um, the, the support that you give to commanders, the advice that you give to commanders has to be, notwithstanding they say they want a yes or no answer, it has to be more than a yes or no answer. A commander that is asking for a yes or no answer is looking for someone to blame. To give you an example of, of what I mean by that, and I'll, um, uh, you know, uh, 
pick on pick on someone. Uh, former Secretary of Defence Donald Rumsfeld has done lots of great things, but this is this is not the the best example. So he's reported to have been livid um, that a US JAG, um, the equivalent of legal losses that we have in Australia, uh, said that a strike against Mullah Omar in October two thousand and one could not proceed. Um, because the JAG had said no. Uh, that was a simple answer, yes or no, and the JAG had said no. So he chose to blame the lawyer, essentially, rather than saying, well, look, the elected representatives of the United States of America have chosen to uh, enact a law that says that we should not strike a target where we're going to cause lots of collateral damage, lots of civilian casualties. He could have embraced that. He could have said, we chose not to strike Mullah Omar because of the potential collateral damage. So what I, what I, the point of that is that the answers have to be more than yes or no, or the, or the discussion has to be more than yes or no. So um, given that sort of applied background, I'm very sympathetic to those trying to achieve practical outcomes. I've signed off on many what we call legal target appreciations about um, strikes, uh, who can be struck and who can't be. Um, but I think we also have to have self-awareness and transparency about our own flaws and deficiencies in legal arguments. So it recognises the, the, the weaknesses of legal arguments, the positions, um, the structures. And to give you another example of that, a, a sort of uh, military-related one, as a matter of law, you could say that civilian, civilian casualties in Afghanistan are permissible, are acceptable. But as a matter of counterinsurgency strategy, it's not a good outcome. It's not a good outcome at all. Um, on the other hand, while I'm very sympathetic to those trying to achieve practical outcomes, I'm very unsympathetic to those looking for simplistic outcomes. So, uh, you know, unless you're Einstein and able to simplify incredible complexity into an equation of an apparently simple E equals MC squared, um, the rest of us have to live with complexity. Uh, and, and, and attempts at apparent simplicity often ignore or, or avoid confronting our own flaws and our own legal arguments. So in the space domain, there are some, I think, overly simplistic arguments. For example, there should be peaceful uses of outer space. Well, if you can tell me what peace means, then come, come back to me. Space is the province of all mankind. There's several problems with that. Space is a new wild west, implying that it's a lawless or, or meant to evoke the manifest destiny of the United States. Um, that, that has some problems, and I'll come back to that. Space is a war-fighting domain. Um, there can be no sovereignty in outer space or extracting space resources is like fishing on the high seas. Um, those are things that are, you know, relatively simplistic and, and there's a lot more complexity to them that requires greater discussion. Um, as uh, a number of other speakers before have said, I, I think one of the most simple things you can say is that space is for all of us. It's not just for billionaires like Jeff Bezos, um, Richard Branson, Elon Musk, it's not just for baby boomers, Gen X like me, Gen Y, or whichever generation you happen to be. It's not just for tech savvy, tech savvy entrepreneurs with their own startup companies. And it's not just for governments and militaries, even though militaries, including the Australian military, are forming their own space forces, like the US as well. Um, the complexity arises because the space domain is changing dramatically. The, the alliteration that is often used in space is becoming more competitive, congested, and contested. I used a, a device, I did a TEDx um, presentation uh, a, a year or so ago. Imagine looking up at the stars and what you see now. Then imagine 10 years from now what you will see when you look up at the stars. And if you see a line of shooting lights, it's probably not a shooting star. It's probably a, a series of satellites going past. And that's somewhat sad to think about. Um, but that's not to say we should stop what we're doing in, in space. We need to understand space is important. Um, 
Timmy Evans referred to this. We need to understand how to live on this planet, not like we own it, but like it's the only place we have to live in this universe, because in all likelihood it is. We need planetary science to understand how planets work and whether there are other options out there. We need Earth observation to understand how human activity is affecting our planet and how to do things more sustainably. We need communication across the globe because we have planet-sized challenges and planet-sized challenges require planet-sized collaboration. Um, so hopefully that gives you an idea of where I'm coming from. The topics on which I'd like to, uh, to, to discuss, and uh, I'm sure we'll get a chance to discuss those. The Woomera Manual, I won't expand on that now, but the full title, the Manual on International Law Applicable to Military Space Activities, the, the title might not end up exactly like that. More on that later. Um, you might be wondering why it's called the Woomera Manual. Woomera is an area of Australia that was, um, from 1947, used for long-range weapons research. And, um, in fact, the word Woomera is from uh, the Aboriginal heritage. It, it, it refers to a thing that you connect to a spear to extend the range of the spear when you throw it. So, very apt for a long-range weapon um, establishment. Uh, Australia has launched satellites from there. It launched a satellite on an American rocket. And so even though Australia launched its own satellite from its own territory, it doesn't quite qualify as a spacefaring state because it wasn't its own rocket, it was an American rocket. So thank you very much. It was a spare uh, US Redstone rocket at that point in time. The UK also launched um, from Woomera in 1971. That was its first launch. Uh, Australia had a relative hiatus between 1971 to 2017. Um, and there was a lot of initiatives, space-related initiatives in Australia that were um, largely blocked because of the close relationship that we had with the US. The thinking was, why would we put all of this effort into a space industry in Australia when we already have this fantastic relationship with the US? That's changing. It's changing because of the commercial nature of outer space. I, I also want to mention space resource exploitation, not because it's an area of deep expertise of mine, but because Australia is in a pretty unique position. So um, the Moon Agreement has only 18 state parties. Um, Australia is one of those. It's also a particip participant in the Artemis Accords. So in the, in the Moon Agreement, you have um, the introduction of this concept of common heritage of mankind, space as the common heritage of mankind. That finds its expression in Article 11.5, which uh, contemplates the establishment of an international regime for space resource exploitation as it's about to become feasible which is arguably right now. Um, and an international regime would involve, um, uh, according to the, the treaty, orderly and safe development, rational management, expansion of opportunities and use, and those three, none of, neither of those I think are particularly controversial. But the fourth one is, the fourth criteria for an international regime is that there will be equitable sharing. And that's where there have been issues. Um, uh, people have wondered why Australia signed up to the, uh, the Moon Agreement. It appears that in the 1980s, uh, Australia was keen to dig up a lot of uranium um, somewhere around there on my picture um, uh, and, and contribute to the global nuclear fuel cycle. Um, but at the same time, the government wanted to be seen to be big on nuclear disarmament. And for whatever reason, somewhat misguided, I think, saw the Moon Agreement as predominantly a nuclear disarmament agreement, and so signed up to that. Um, the fact is, whatever the reason, Australia is a party to the Moon Agreement. Um, agreements must be kept, the Latin term, pacta sub servanda. Um, but we're also, a participant in the Artemis Accord. Uh, the Artemis Accord refers to extraction being not inherently constituting national appropriation under Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty. Um, 
there was Australia is in a, somewhat of an awkward position because, of course, there was the Trump executive order of 6th of April 2020 um, that objects to any suggestion of the Moon Agreement um, that it reflects customary international law. So that is uh, somewhat of an awkward position for Australia. If Australia were to say, for example, um, look, we signed up to the Artists, uh, to the Artemis Accords, uh, and we think that that's consistent with the Moon Agreement. Um, I, I imagine that there would be um, objection to the to the mention of the Moon Agreement by the um, US government because they're obliged to do so by the executive order. Um, so uh, that's that's all that I'm going to say, except to say uh, what I have to say, which is um, nothing I say in this is reflective of a, of a position of the Australian government. It's it's my position alone. The mistakes uh, are mine. Having said that, um, as I say, it's an honour to be part of this panel. Um, it, it's it's incredible to be part uh, of a panel that involves these amazing people. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Duncan. Really, I, I appreciate it. And I think we're also lucky to have that perspective, which is often I, left out of a lot of these discussions. So thank you. And we pass now to Mr. Gold. Please carefully take the floor so you don't hurt yourself, please. I'm almost to the point where I'll wear a helmet to a Zoom meeting <laughs> right now. And, and it's perfect that I'm going and I know I'm supposed to talk about my background, but I can't possibly not address some of the things that Duncan just said uh, relative to the Artemis Accord. So I appreciate Duncan throwing that up at me as, uh, again, it's just a brief background. You know, I conceived, developed, and led uh, the Artemis Accords effort when I was at NASA. And one of the issues that we were looking at was to ensure that the Accords were absolutely compliant with the Moon Agreement that the Accords were intended and are a uniting document that represents the common ground between nations such as Australia or, or France that are signatories to the Moon Agreement and those like the United States that, as Duncan mentioned, have an explicit policy opposed to the Moon Agreement. So particularly relative to the resources sections, we were very cautious to ensure that what the Accords say is that you can extract resources, you can utilize resources, and all such extraction and utilization must be done in full compliance with Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty, should be done in a sustainable manner. And then the accords are silent relative to sharing regimes or what happens afterwards, knowing that we wanted the accords to be broad enough to accommodate a variety of views relative to pro-moon agreement or against the moon agreement. So I would argue that Australia is actually in a perfect position, not in an awkward position, that I, I was really excited about Australia to come on, not because uh, they were against the Moon Agreement, but because they had signed the Moon Agreement. And, and it demonstrates that a Moon Agreement signatory could also be a signatory to the Artemis Accords just as easily as one that wasn't. I think it's important to recall that the Accords don't represent the US position. Again, it represents a common ground position among the countries that were participating in the construction and drafting. And even for countries that weren't, we tried to develop as inclusive a document as possible that any nation that had signed the Outer Space Treaty would be able to participate and abide by the simple universal aspects uh, of the Accords. Now, of course, again, the Accords are a beginning of a conversation. We can talk more about the Accords later, not an ending. And that's an artifact of the fact that we didn't resolve uh, the space resources issue. That again, there still could be a very big difference between the United States with the executive order opposing the Moon Agreement and then a country like Australia or others who have signed. So uh, a lot of work to be done. What the Accords were trying to do was just to find that common ground uh, among us. So just to go back to my own history, uh, I grew up on a Native American reservation in uh, Northeastern Montana and certainly was always looking at the stars. Uh, we actually left the reservation when I was eight for Billings, Montana. I remember telling my parents we can't leave and abandon our people like this, and that's when she broke it to me. I'm Jewish, not uh, Native American, unfortunately. I haven't recovered ever since. Um, but yeah, it was terrific you know, living in that community and, and you know, seeing the stars, and I'm, I'll just admit I'm a Star Trek fan from the beginning. Ever since I could remember, Star Trek had 
inspired me, that dream, the excitement of not just better technology, but a better world um, and the more peaceful, diverse, inclusive society uh, that Star Trek had represented. So I was excited not only about exploration, but uh, about improving, you know, our human condition and more tolerance, et cetera, uh, that the show had always represented. Um, was in love with quantum mechanics and cosmology and physics, but unfortunately was too stupid to really pursue any of those things. Uh, my algebra teacher in high school was also my football coach, and he told my mother in a PTA meeting, Mike tries to go too fast in algebra and goes too slow on the football field. So it was pretty brutal for me growing up. Uh, however, talked a lot. So, you know, law school came naturally. But even in my early legal career, I always tried to weave space into it. So I had a terrific opportunity to uh, be an intern at NASA Langley Research Center. Samara will recall uh, the great Kathy Kirk. Uh, who was the chief counsel at NASA Langley for a number of years. I actually had my choice between Kennedy Space Center and Langley, but again, as a Star Trek fan, I couldn't turn down working for a Kirk at NASA, so I ended up uh, going with Kathy, and she was just an amazing individual and learned a lot uh, in that office. Um, hey, and I actually, I see in the chat someone from Billing Senior who I actually graduated from as well. So uh, in any event, uh, after graduating law school, I ended up working for a law firm called McGuire Woods in DC, pursuing a number of crazy ideas, such as launching from Wallops Island, Virginia, to the International Space Station, which I'm pleased to say is now happening, so maybe not as crazy as we all thought it once was. And because I was working on spaceports, um, I got a call from, again, my home state, Montana. Uh, Samara and others may remember the Venture Star project, I'm just showing my age here, which was a space shuttle replacement a single stage to orbit system that never came to fruition. But in Montana, we actually had five different sites that wanted to launch it, two of which got in a fist fight in front of the Capitol in Helena, Montana. And we're actually still suing each other even after the program ended. So a bit of a mess. And uh, they ended up bringing me on. I took leave of absence from my law firm to help establish the Montana Aerospace Development Authority to coordinate some of these issues in a way that involved less violence. My girlfriend and now uh, wife at the time, uh, I brought her out to Montana uh, to see uh, Helena, which is a lovely city. And she couldn't understand how we keep people in the city without armed guards and barbed wire for people to escape the civilization in tears in five minutes. We ended up getting engaged uh, quickly after that. And then quickly after that, I had to return to Washington. And this is during like the go-go 2000 internet boom days. So half of my firm had already been bought out by another. So rather than go back uh, to McGuire, I ended up going to uh, Patton Boggs, uh, which at the time was the number one lobbying shop. I wanted to do more policy work. And I had met Robert Bigelow in Bigelow Aerospace during my time in Montana, trying to get them to locate uh, in Montana. And while I failed at that, I did succeed in interesting him in a number of policy issues and this is, we were way ahead of our time, I'm afraid, Leo commercialization. Microgravity represents a whole new arena uh, for scientific commercial development. So we wanted to build commercial space stations, particularly leveraging inflatable habitat technology, which is tent-like technology where the habitat is compact in the rocket fairing and expands out. We ended up then, uh, after a couple of years representing him at Patton Boggs, I opened up the Bigelow DC office, and we ended up launching the first prototypes of inflatable habitats ever developed on converted Russian nuclear missiles, literally swords into plowshares. And it was so amazing for me to go to Siberia on an active Russian nuclear missile base. So I never complain about the weather in DC anymore, by the way, it's lovely. I could go swimming in uh, December, relative to what I experienced in Russia. But to see these weapons of war and these people who were painted as the enemy when I grew up, I, I lived in fear. Uh, of the Cold War and of a nuclear holocaust. And then to see them transformed as an adult uh, into peaceful tools of exploration, it, it just gave me an optimism in space and what space can mean, what the future can be, no matter how bleak things look. So it was a really tremendous experience launching uh, Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, then we did the BEAM, the Bigelow Expandable Activity Module, it was mentioned, which is still on the International Space Station today. And then I left for Space Systems Loral, uh, which at the time was the number one geo telecommunications manufacturer, opened up their DC office. Then that transformed the Maxar uh, technologies when there was a merger with Digital Globe. 
uh, and then I was as mentioned, um, served a number of roles and left though, as I was the VP for civil space, uh, business development when Jim Bridenstine came knocking on my door because my bank account and life was going too well. And I had been talking to Jim uh, for months, if not a year, about something called the Artemis Accords, uh, which, you know, the idea was to try and create the broadest, largest, most diverse human spaceflight beyond LEO coalition in history. And, you know, finally, and it's a very long story, but he made me uh, put my money where my mouth was and I ended up leaving a very comfortable uh, and promising corporate career to come to NASA to assist in the development of the Artemis Accords, um, as well as the gateway, the binding gateway agreements that we got done, which are probably of equal importance where there was substantial financial contributions made in the hardware to building the new habitat, platform uh, station that will orbit the moon and really keep the flame lit for the amazing work done by the International Space Station. We worked on a number of other policy issues such as updating planetary protection and did a series of MOUs, we used to call it MOU Palooza, including one that was intended to revive the relationship United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs uh, between NASA and the UN. Um, my wife gave me one year at NASA. Uh, she said, you have to leave after that. Um, I was about a year and a half, so I just went a little bit over, uh, and I'm now back in the private sector at Redwire Space, in a terrific company where we're developing rollout solar arrays, which are the solar arrays are compacted and then roll out like a carpet. They're actually operational now on the International Space Station. Uh, we're the only company that's ever manufactured something on the International Space Station, so we're Again, exploring this incredible new potential for commercial and scientific development in microgravity, uh, as well as sun sensors, star trackers, variety of products that are being used on everything from Mars probes, the International Space Station. We got a regolith printer uh, on the ISS, which is terrific in terms of how we can print uh, bricks, et cetera. So uh, I will stop there and just say uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here. Appreciate the dean and everything that you know, David, you did. And I know how I used to be a editor of the uh, Journal of Constitutional Law uh, at University of Pennsylvania, and I know how much work that can be. So really appreciate everything the students are doing here, and particularly tackling this incredibly important topic, because I always say the engineers have the easy stuff, right? The engineering, come on, like, you know, that's just math. There's no rocket equation for figuring out Congress or liability, et cetera. And I honestly do believe that the greatest challenges that we have ahead of us in space, particularly commercial space, are legal financial, policy, and political, not engineering. So, you know, lawyers should keep their heads held high that our role is just as important, if not more so, uh, than any of the engineers out there. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for reminding all of our student audience members, especially that this is something they should do with a, um, an understanding of the potential and the power of it, rather than just being the butt of many a lawyer joke. So thank you very much. And now, Ms. Thompson King, if you would like to close our beginning session before we move on to the questions. There we go. I think we're on mute it now. Great. Thank you so much. So uh, it really is an honor to be here amongst this August body. And I'll start off with the fact that I am the outlier. I am a child of the 70s. And if you had told me when I started college and uh, I went to uh, register for my first set of courses and they told me um, we've implemented a new policy, you set your own curriculum, you just have to graduate with the 120 hours. And I said, I'm never taking a science or math class again. Okay, I just said, yay. And then I go through law school and an opportunity presents itself to go work for this agency called NASA. Now we all knew NASA, I grew up with NASA, but they have lawyers at NASA. I mean, that was the question that everybody asked me. They have lawyers at NASA. What do lawyers at NASA do? Do you decide if they're little green people and from Mars someplace? Uh, nope. We do a lot of important work at NASA. And I guess the thing that I would tell law students as you're thinking about careers, 
Uh, NASA, you know, as a government agency, we deal with a lot of issues. You heard my career being described. Uh, I have worked on personnel matters. I've worked on government acquisitions. One of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that most of NASA's budget goes out to government contractors. Uh, when you see the mission control on TV, Mission control uh, is operated mostly by contractor personnel, meaning that NASA contracts with companies who provide services to us. So we do a lot of contract work, about 85% of our budget is contract work. Uh, that's how I started my career, working on those issues. We have a lot of intellectual property issues that the agency works on and that you've heard discussed here today with international law issues that we work on. So the breadth of uh, opportunities at NASA is just amazing. And it was unexpected by me. Um, and so it has been a wonderful career for me, working on litigation matters, working on international law matters, meeting people from all around the country, meeting people from all around the world uh, to talk about space issues. And one of the things that I've learned since I've been at NASA, and which has made me frankly turn into a space geek and really think about space and what we are, what we are going to do in the space area uh, uh, as we move forward is this word inclusion. NASA created a fifth core value and our fifth core value is inclusion. And you've heard several people today talk about inclusion. And that's the thing I think I'm thinking about most uh, when I look at the, the work that we are doing as an agency. Uh, we are looking at how we can include more people in our country, in our programs, to make it more diverse in the number of women, the number of people of color. We, we want to draw on talent that's, that is untouched, untapped. And what do we want this talent to do? We want this talent to explore. We want this talent to explore and help us to think of ways of exploring space, exploring other planets, celestial bodies, going to moon, the moon, uh, returning to the moon, uh, going on to Mars. And so it's, it's a very exciting time for the agency. Uh, we are looking at how we can broaden our work with our international partners. Uh, we're looking at how we can broaden our work with colleges, universities in this country. And so uh, there, there's just a lot of it, exciting and inclusive work that's going on. We have the Artemis Accords that are in place. There are going to be other things that we are going to, uh, to negotiate with both our domestic and international partners. So one of the things that I would say to law students as you think about careers and think about choices, you have no idea sometimes what's going to present itself as an opportunity to you. And the things that I am working on now are just things I never would have anticipated. I've had to grow in my experience, expand my knowledge into particular areas. Heck, I had to learn how to negotiate um, uh, uh, construction matters. And you say, what does construction have to do with space? Well, if you don't have that thing called a test stand, and if you don't get the right contractor in place to build that test stand, so we can run the test at our Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. And if you don't know where Mississippi is, you need to pull out an atlas and learn your geography because NASA is all around the country. And all these things are important in supporting space exploration. Uh, we are not just a, a one dimensional agency and space is not one dimensional. So we wanna bring in people with all kinds of talents, all kinds of thoughts and uh, help us as we NASA uh, look at returning to the moon. And also one of my, my areas of, of interest and really it was not my area of interest, it became my area of interest is section 102C of the Space Act as amended. And you're probably saying, why 102C of the Space Act as amended? Because if you look at the history and look at the original Space Act that established NASA, there was a word that was not included in the Space Act, and that word was commercial. It was not commercial activities. So in 1985, and I have to remind folks that this was under the Reagan administration, Section 102C was added. And this section encourages uh, the NASA administrator to seek and encourage to the maximum extent possible, the fullest commercial use of space. 
So uh, one of the things that I have been engaged in, frankly, since 2004 is really uh, implementing that language. What are the things that we can do to encourage commercial activities? Uh, and a lot of folks probably think, well, NASA is a, a federal government agency. You're there to run programs. No, we're there to not only run programs, but to support the fullest commercial use of space. How do we do that? And that gets to that word inclusion. How do we bring in folks to help us reach that fullness of what, uh, what we can do in space, how we can get folks involved, uh, and how, the, how we can build a business. Uh, we have the International Space Station. I know many folks are, are aware that it costs um, a significant amount of money to maintain that space station. We have a finite, NASA does not have deep pockets. We have a finite set of money that Congress gives us to operate our programs. So part of the creative thinking that we have to do is think about how do we continue our current programs, but then move on to additional programs. But for those things that are in place, how do we keep them going? One way to keep them going is to inspire and encourage commercial use of that, that, that capability, help them to sustain it. You heard, heard um, Mike talk about um, uh, the Artemis Accords looking to create a sustainable program. That's something that NASA is still focused on. How do we sustain the activities that we have? Not just create something, do it and cre create all of this debris and we have a lot of space debris up there that's interfering with new activities that are going on. So we really have to think about how we can uh, create sustainable programs and then how NASA can move on, uh, do uh, other research and then foster uh, commercial activities so that we can explore qu faster, quicker and be more inclusive in, that, in, in our approach. So it's really an exciting time to be at NASA. This is an exciting panel and uh, look forward to the uh, conversation that we're going to continue to have. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was truly inspiring and just an amazing opportunity to close out this discussion of journeys as well as, as space policy and space issues, but really the journeys that you have all been on uh, to get to these points. So thank you all for those insights. Um, we have a slew of questions for which I want to make sure that I take absolutely no credit at all. This is all David coming up with some very intense and very um, thought provoking sets of questions. So I think we'll go into those, David, and then we'll uh, we'll go to the questions from the audience. Perfect. So we jump to our first set of discussions, which is kind of the more UN focused um, international set of questions. And the first issue to be raised is the idea that the Outer Space Tra Treaty has survived challenges before. Um, it has faced circumstances such as rapidly accelerating uh, drives to commercialize space by non-state actors recently, as well as, um, as many of you may have heard, the recent announcement of China's unannounced or unannounced prior, prior to its uh, conduct uh, testing of a hypersonic glide vehicle in August, um, all of which suggests that there may be violations of Article 4 of the OST occurring. Is it time with this in mind to withdraw from the Outer Space Treaty or perhaps to update the language itself within the treaty? And I understand that many of you will have uh, varying views and differing views, so I pose the question to the floor. If Someone would like to start. Please jump in. Don't be polite. I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I think there's there was a reference to the outer space treaty having survived challenges before. I know that it's um, been a question that's been considered by Congress in the US before. And happily, the outcome was that um, the outer space treaty has provided for certainty and stability to facilitate lots of great achievements in the development of space infrastructure on which we will rely. There are some gaps in the Outer Space Treaty, or probably more precisely, that there's lack, lack of clarity rather than gaps, if you like. Um, so for myself, I, I think we need to, um, 
I, I don't think we need to revisit the Outer Space Treaty. I think that would be a mistake. I don't think we would end up with um, something nearly as good in a sense as what we already have. Um, I am a fan of um, not being over ambitious with uh, how we progress from here. I think every little bit helps. Um, there are always suggestions that we need a new legally binding treaty. I, I think that might be over ambitious at this stage. Um, and I think it's, we don't need a one shot wonder. Uh, I think things like the Artemis Accords um, and possibly an ASAT test ban, an anti-satellite test ban. Um, the, the Russian and Chinese proposals for no first placement of weapons in space and prevention of placement of weapons treaty need some work on definitions and verifiability, but there's no reason why if they could do that, that, that could be considered. There's the uh, UN's just approved a possible um, uh, open-ended working group on space norms. I know in DARPA, the Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency, um, there's a group that is examining rendezvous and proximity operations and establishing norms for those. Um, I've mentioned before that I'm working on the Woomera Manual. All of that is to say every little bit helps, and I don't think we should be looking for one-shot wonders. Yeah, I just want to violently agree there, or peacefully agree with Duncan, I should say, that um, the Outer Space Treaty has really stood the test of time, is the spine, the foundation of space law, and to pull out would be disastrous. Even if there is a violation of it, there's no reason to run away from a, a treaty whose principles and objectives are, uh, I think, timeless. And, and I think this is why the Outer Space Treaty has survived the years so well, that it's not prescriptive. It's a treaty of principles, that the objectives of avoiding harmful uh, contamination, avoiding harmful interference, of peace, of scientific sharing, those are eternal. And because the Outer Space Treaty wasn't prescriptive in terms of necessarily how you get there, but had these you know, relatively universal objectives, it's why we shouldn't be pulling out. I joke that the Outer Space Treaty is over 50 years old, but doesn't look a day over 35. But I think it's as relevant today as it has ever been. Uh, I mentioned we, I testified before Congress, and that was actually one of the topics that I testified on and argued vociferously for maintaining the Outer Space Treaty. And as Duncan said, if we go in and try to make changes, we will likely end up with something not as good or possibly way worse than we have now. So maintaining the treaty, everyone should remain a part of the treaty. However, as Duncan mentioned, and this was the purpose of the Accords and other activities, we do need to take a step further in terms of how we implement the objectives of the Outer Space Treaty. So we say, for example, avoid harmful interference in the Outer Space Treaty. Well, how do we do that? And what we came up with the Accords and what other international groups have done such as the Hague International Space Resources Governance Working Group, is safety zone. And so you have an obligation in an area to inform the UN where you are, to be public about your activities and what's going on, and then to coordinate with anyone else who enters in the area. So there are certainly things that we need to do to implement, to add to the bones of the Outer Space Treaty, but those bones are very solid. And I, for one, would never want to see the US or any other country walk away from the Outer Space Treaty, and I hope more countries sign. Excellent. Any other comments? Say no. All right. We shall jump from the OST to another aspect of the OST, which is space debris. Um, and the question being, if we can't or shouldn't update uh, the OST, then who should be responsible for cleaning up debris of blown up, collided, defunct, or derelict space objects? Um, for example, satellites or discarded rocket stages. Um, should this be a commercial requirement, commercial liability? Should it be a sovereign state issue? I'll jump in real quick. I was uh, just uh, <clears throat> in a webinar earlier today with uh, Space, Space Prime, Orbital Prime, and just yesterday uh, with uh, Defense Innovation Unit um, for their uh, GSIP, 
and uh, they are very, as they say, laser focused on uh, addressing um, space debris. And I think the timeline is something like within 24 months, uh, executing a prototype removal uh, of space debris um, through the uh, funding programs such as SBIR, STTR, et cetera. Some of the, from the intellectual property perspective, some of the more uh, interesting uh, opportunities there might be uh, along the lines of uh, DIU because they're using other transaction authority money. And that's not constricted by by dole which is the uh, kind of advent of my career field in academic tech transfer, um, giving universities and other recipients of federal funds, so, you know, such as NASA as well, the, the right to elect to retain title to the inventions created by their employees. Um, and so under Baidol comes um, this government purpose license, the requirement that the federal agency, you know, such as NASA, if they fund somebody, um, would, would then be able to make use of that invention. But under OTA, uh, and, and so those rights uh, and, and government purpose rights can be, especially data use rights, can be uh, tricky and sticky uh, for um, commercial entities. And so other transaction authority funds uh, can be a way to get around some of those buy dole requirements. So uh, sorry, a little, little tangent there on some of that, but absolutely, um, I, I think we're looking at it from a commercial lens uh, and in terms of how do we address the problem? At least to start with the with the agencies willing to put up the money to uh, to start to take some of that down. I think Alexandra, you and I are friends in the climate space, and so this is really the same issues that we see at the climate change convention, and we we hear about the fact that every single actor in space is a pollutant. You know, to get to space, you have to you know you have to create debris, and so. Every, when when everyone is contributing, it's very difficult to say who is responsible, and it's very difficult to say who should take that first action. I mean, we keep we keep talking about the Europeans with this envy sat. This is like this massive piece of debris that is just like okay. We know that the Europeans, the Americans, and the Russians have, I think, something like the fifty largest pieces of debris that have been identified have been from those three actors. So. You know, there's an opportunity where if those three actors are not going to take the first step and say, we're going to remove our own debris, like who else is going to, right? And so people keep pushing on the Europeans with this NVSAT satellite and just being like, you have this massive piece of junk that is a collision risk. What are you going to do about it? And it's just really challenging because what we've come to is that we have a set of non-binding regulations, you know, the space debris mitigation guidelines that that kind of took took maybe a dozen, you know, 10 years to negotiate or like something crazy to just come up with like the minimum set of best practices. And it's just very difficult and challenging to say that those should be binding, though you can kind of make it binding through the licensing procedure of the different countries, right? So even though it may be difficult internationally, well, the licensing authority can kind of say, okay, what is your space debris mitigation? But we do have this idea or this complex that even if everyone from today change their designs and change their behavior we still have this issue and people are still differing believe it or not on like the severity of the issue because we can keep going the way we're going right and it's like but now we've heard with elon musk and with these low earth orbits that are coming on we're going to have 10 to 100,000 satellites launched over the coming decade. So yes, we've been able to get away with not really taking it really seriously, but if we're gonna exponentially increase our space activities, we have to do something different. And I think the reason I'm not gonna give space people too much of a hard time is because you and I are in the climate space and we know that even on earth, like people are really struggling with this issue. And so it's like a behavioral change that needs to happen an awareness that it looks like space is big, but that's what we thought about the oceans. And then we heard about plastics pollution. So yes, space is big, but the areas you wanna utilize is not big. 
and also the mentality that you're going with, we need to be sustainable right from the beginning. So these are some of the things that I think about with the space debris issue. Absolutely. Just I, can I just add one parallel about the environmental sphere, which is that in both, and I think there's a very strong lesson to me to be learned from this, in both people tend to think of it as a faraway problem, uh, not only spatially, but also temporally and as something that may impact way down the line, if at all, um, and that something is, that is very much removed from their daily lives. And so certainly over the past, you know, I don't even remember how many days I've been in, in Scotland because it's been that kind of week, but um, over those past several days, we've seen this real kind of high level push for non-binding principles and targets as an achievement, but at the same time, we don't see it as a binding and enforceable achievement. And in the same way that we celebrate it, um, as some people do, they don't really understand what they're celebrating and what they're not celebrating, which is a, a legally binding regime. And I think we see a lot of overlap in space. And if anything, space might learn from what we're doing here and what we've been doing certainly since Paris, because we know so much more about what will cause, what will be the cause of future environmental damage than we do what will be space damage. And we're still not able to process that. Um, so hopefully there will be some lessons. But. And I think Michael is correcting me in the chat that the US um, has no objects in the top 50 list. But even if the US has no objects in the top 50 list, if those actors are not going to take the first steps in really remediating, you know, what is there? Nigeria has five satellites in space, you know, like, yes, we can also take that first step, but the US has most of the satellites in space and will have most of the satellites moving forward. So, you know, is in a position to make a dent on this conversation. And the US has so much to lose. I mean, you know, we talk about, you'd mentioned the billionaire playboys going to space, et cetera. And I think often the general public doesn't recognize how much space influences their daily lives until there's an accident and we lose access to space and GPS goes down, and the banking system goes down, our remote sensing systems go down, it would be disastrous. And I cannot emphasize enough the exigency and the urgency of this issue. It could literally threaten the very underpinnings of our modern society. And as you just described with the constellations, I, this is beginning to develop in an exponential fashion. And again, we want constellations, we want innovation, but we also want to preserve the environment to make sure that they can function and that we protect it and keep safe these activities and the world. And the U.S. has to move. The U.S. has to be active on this. And it probably begins with at least assigning an agency that's responsible for the debris issue. Because right now, I think it's confused. And I also don't think the FCC necessarily should be that entity either. Because, again, they don't answer directly. You know, they're not responsive. People say they do a great job, but we really have to take a hard look at who the regulatory entity should be. And then the U.S. leaning forward relative to ensuring not because we don't want commercial activity, but because we want it to succeed. We want the environment to be there. A, a regime that's sustainable. And then we can go to the rest of the world and hopefully they follow suit. And again, this isn't just a challenge, but it's an opportunity. So a company like Redwire, we have OSAM, Orbital Servicing Assembly Manufacturer. We're at this incredible era where satellites and robotics are merging to create something entirely different. Well, there's a way to take care of that and address the debris, but there has to be money that someone has to move forward, whether it's liability, whether it's paying people to get rid of debris, we've got to move forward with some sort of policy before it's too late. And I think the urgency is now, we can have our cake and eat it too with constellations and robust development, but we've got to look out for the sustainability of the environment, otherwise we lose everything. So I, I think this is an extremely important issue. It's a policy issue. And I hope that the uh, National Space Council, because this is a perfect issue for the National Space Council of America, it's so cross-cutting, uh, deals with it and deals with it with alacrity because it's extremely important. Yeah, and Mike, let me follow up. And I, I and um, I'm not speaking on behalf of all of NASA, but um, uh, if you look at the NASA website, and I just pulled it up, 
Um, I'll dispute a little bit some of the comments in chat that says NASA says we can wait decades. This really has not been our position. Uh, now, you might criticize the agency for this, but NASA is not a regulatory agency. But what we have been doing in looking at um, the debris, orbital debris issue, is uh, we look at debris protect protection, we look at debris mitigation, we look at debris remediation. And one of the things, and I'm actually looking at, at our page here, because what we clearly say is, as Mike was saying, there is no US government entity that has been assigned the task of removing existing on orbit debris. Now, folks may argue NASA created that, but a lot of those 27,000 pieces come from the commercial sector. So it's not just a, a one government or one country problem. Uh, it, and we are not looking, I don't think anyone is looking at, make, at waiting decades, but um, we have not seen, I would say the political will and that's a little P, meaning the people have to come together, governments have to come together, we have to have a will to one, enforce and create more debris mitigation programs and more de debris remediation activities and identify where the funding is going to come from. Those have been very difficult conversations to have. We have not been successful. Um, sometimes I think it may take just what Mike mentioned. We're going to have to have a very significant reason for us to do this. And obviously we haven't had that reason. I, I don't want to see that happen, but frankly, countries, businesses sometimes don't act until they are absolutely forced to. Definitely, absolutely. And it does it highlights such an important aspect of governance, which I know uh, to me always talks about as well. And, and that is you know, the, the challenge of how do you create a governing system that it addresses so many multiple facets and does it in such a way that is seemingly at least um, capable of respecting each of the various components involved. Um, and it, it really is quite challenging. So thank you. Um, and as a follow-up, because there is a follow-up, I think we really address what the main uh, question, but the follow-up question that David had brilliantly crafted was the idea of what is the potential consequence if there is a failure to adequately address the proliferation of space debris? Um, what, what happens if we can't figure out who regulates? What do we do? Well, we're, we're currently tracking. Oh, Joe. Please, please, Duncan. Go ahead. So, so I think Mike mentioned uh, some of these al already, um, you know, the, the degree to which uh, society relies on space infrastructure is very significant and, and the outcomes to modern society don't bear thinking about. Um, so all that's not usable for centuries or millennia typically launching through an orbit, um, maybe signal interference, although that's getting beyond my uh, expertise. Um, but I just wanted to mention some other challenges. So we've mentioned the, the sort of uh, challenge of who's responsible, which government is responsible. Uh, if you're talking about commercial entities, is there an economic case to clean it up? Um, I can't help making a reference to uh, a bit of sci-fi, Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, in, in, in that book, he talks about things being somebody else's problem. And that there's an SEP field around something. This is this has an SEP field around it. It's it's, it's somebody else's problem. Um, but in addition to those challenges, the, the sorts of technologies that are being developed, uh, for example, um, lasers pointed at pieces of debris to cause ablation or photon pressure to slow it down and therefore to deorbit, or means of grappling a piece of space debris or a um, or, or a defunct satellite, um, there's a pretty obvious dual use issue there, as in if you can use it for those purposes, could you use it for hostile purposes as well? Um, and, and another challenge is that I don't think you can establish new rules for this independently of technology, institutions, funding, committing people to whatever the solution is. You actually have to establish or, or develop all of those things concurrently. 
uh, and it's difficult to get together a, 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 an interdisciplinary community to, to discuss those sorts of things. And, and, and the, uh, the final challenge I wanted to mention is that it's inherently international. Um, you need consensus internationally and um, consensus internationally is a pretty difficult thing to come by. I mean, a first step, uh, a, 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 the, the, the biggest um, player in the space domain being the US, working out who in the US um, is responsible for it would be a first step, but then it's also an international issue. How do we get consensus in the, in the international community? Well, I'll chime in quick, just on the, the consequences, potential consequences. One of the consequences that we've already seen is that from years ago, when a launch window was hours, you know, several three hours long, you could, you know, launch at any point during there and have a clear launch. At this point, we're looking at launch windows of 10 to 15 minutes. And, and so the more congested uh, space becomes, um, we're tracking close to 30,000 objects at this point, some between five centimeter and 10 centimeter. We're, we think we're tracking everything 10 centimeter and up, but between one and five centimeters, we don't have good tracking and, and stuff even below one centimeter, even paint chips can you know uh, have potential um, uh, really negative consequences at those high velocity impacts. Um, and so one of the potential consequences, uh, the, the kind of, um, you know, a doomsday scenario, I think was, was actually dreamed up by a NASA scientist, um, uh, Kessler, uh, who coined the, uh, and, and the Kessler syndrome is, is coined after, um, you know, his, his, um, uh, hypothesis that there would potentially come a time when uh, space is so congested that a single collision could result in a cascade of additional collisions that would fall on from that and potentially render low earth orbit relatively useless. So, you know, I began in my opening remarks by saying that the lawyers are so much more important than the engineers. Here's our chance to prove that, right? And, and again, I think this is a great example of that. And sorry for offending all the engineers, but I guarantee that the engineers can take care of the systems and the hardware to address the debris mitigation issue. But the policy, the legal structure, that's what we don't have. And this, I think, would be a terrific exercise for Albany Law School, for the Law Review, and for academia throughout the world to look at this issue. And I'm just beginning from a US perspective, but I completely believe this is a global issue although I think the U.S. has a responsibility and a need here uh, to be a first mover, if not the leader, look at what it is that we need to do to address this problem. We all know it's a problem. You're not going to see any disagreement relative to it, not only being a problem, but you know, probably a crisis. What's the liability regime that would resolve this? What is the financial incentive that would resolve this? What's the congressional appropriations to create technologies to address this? What's the plan? And here I think both lawyers, policymakers, economists, you know, the social sciences need to get together and it would be terrific to look at this issue and suggest a pathway forward beginning with the United States from both a regulatory, financial incentive and technology perspective. This is the challenge that I put out there to all the law students and law professors before, as Stephen described, we get to a Kessler effect. We need to do it now. We need to do it quickly and we need good policy developed to address this issue. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, we're just we're skipping all around the various topics. It's wonderful. It's great. It's you know David's organization of how to uh, how to probe all these issues. And um, I think coming off of space debris, it's highly appropriate that we then get into the Artemis Accords. And um, many of you will be familiar with them. Some of you may not be familiar with them, um, but they really are some of the most kind of updated senses that we have, especially at the global level with the number of states that are starting to sign um, of, of where we may see future developments in space law. And um, at the same time, we see that both Russia and China have refused to join the accords. Um, so the first question really just gets to the legitimacy and the idea of legitimacy if you have 
um, Russia and China, who are not only significant international actors generally and members of the Security Council, but also obviously very, very core crucial players in, uh, in the international space regime, not signing the Artemis Accords not agreeing to the Artemis Accords, what does this do to their legitimacy and the, the legitimacy of the signatures of other states? Um, obviously, the, the US was really the founder of these like, the accords, but what does it do to other states who are signing on? So happy to field that one. Um, I, I think, it, and forgive me, the question reflects a little bit of a misperception of what the accords are and are intended to be. The accords are not a replacement for the Outer Space Treaty. Again, they're intended to implement the Outer Space Treaty, the Registration Convention, reinforce our international obligations. And the first word of the Artemis Accords is Artemis. So the intent is for the US, Australia, and all the countries that are participating in the Artemis program to reinforce their commitment to these international agreements and treaties. And then there's a little bit more that isn't necessarily explicitly in the treaty, such as the full free and open release of scientific data, which I would hope that everyone would agree to is important that we should move forward with. When we say China and Russia refusing to sign the accords, China and Russia were never part of the Artemis program, that I certainly hope that China and Russia would articulate their own version of the Artemis Accords, that as they go forward with their operations on the moon and on Mars, that they explain publicly, how will they implement the Outer Space Treaty? How will they avoid harmful interference? How will they preserve heritage? Will they release and commit to releasing scientific data freely, openly, and in a timely fashion? Uh, I hope they will. And I want to say that you know, of course, I love the Artemis Accord, so I'm biased, but we don't necessarily have 100% lock on the truth or every good idea. That, as I mentioned, the beauty of the Outer Space Treaty is it's not prescriptive. There's probably some different ways to achieve the objectives of what the Outer Space Treaty says. And that's why, you know, the Accords are the best solution that we could come up with to ensure that we're being explicit. And by we, I'm saying all of the Artemis countries that are participating in the Artemis program are committed to the multilateral agreements that we've done. Again, something like harmful interference. This explains how we're going to try and prevent harmful interference. And the accords explicitly state we're going to learn. Again, the accords are a beginning of discussion. You know, 10 years ago or so, we didn't even think there was any water on the moon. We thought it was bone dry. Now we discover there's vast quantities of water ice. I think there's many more mysteries that the moon has yet to reveal, and we're going to learn so much which is why the Artemis Accords are riddled with references to saying that we will take our experiences in executing the Artemis program and bring it to the United Nations COPUS, bring it to other international forums so that it can inform future treaties, future regulations, future voluntary agreements. Again, a beginning, not an ending. Well, I would love nothing more than you know, China or Russia to commit to the principles of the Artemis Accords, to join you know, potentially the Artemis program, although again, that's a, a political decision. You know, to say that China or Russia rejects the accords when they're not already part of the Artemis program, again, I think is a misinterpretation of what's being accomplished. I think though that the accords were written to be inclusive. Well, I know that they were written to be inclusive, so there shouldn't be anything that China or Russia would disagree with. But I think there are different paths available and I would be very interested, and this is what we hoped with the Accords, that it would inspire a conversation internationally, particularly with those countries that didn't sign, to say, hey, this is how we are going to move forward in a peaceful fashion to implement the objectives of Outer Space Treaty, Registration Convention, uh, et cetera. And I hate to quote a New York Yankee, but as Yogi Bear says, it's tough to make predictions, particularly about the future, but I would gamble to say that when and if, and I think we will see from China and Russia and other countries, similar implementation you know, agreements or statements or paths, I guarantee that they're very similar <laughs> to the Accords, that 90% you know, of what's there is going to be very similar. There may be a few differences, such as the transparency provisions, but I think that's where, again, the Accords are terrific influence that the US and the Artemis partners should lead by example in terms of an open, 
transparent space exploration program, one that explicitly addresses debris mitigation, sustainability, um, transparency, interoperability. I think these are great values to build a future upon, and that if China and Russia either become part of the Artemis program, sign the Artemis boards, or if they come out with their own implementation, that's what the accords were meant to do to inspire that discussion and to try and lead by example. I think I've been on enough panels with Mike to have drank the Kool-Aid on this, but <laughs> still have to, you know, bring that perspective internationally about, you know, what people's concerns were about it. I think Mike has done a great job over the months to basically say that like everything else, there's a lot of misconceptions that like the fact that the US is the first one to propose something is initially already going to get a whole bunch of, you know, concerns. And like, I think Mike said it best in that even if Russia and China come up with their own agreement, it's going to be very similar because everyone is basically saying we're going with the foundations of the Outer Space Treaty. I mean, the Artemis Accords added a few things. Even though they're going to say the safety zones, the US are going to say the safety zones is Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty. It's just basically, you know, getting you to do consultation and like getting you to like talk. People, others would still argue that that sense of creating a safety zone is still kind of like appropriation, even though they're going to tell you that essentially it's not like a keep out zone. So there is a distinction between a keep out zone and a zone in which clearly, and, and I think the challenge is that clearly if you're gonna have commercial activity, people do need some sense of like, this is my, this is where I'm operating, right? So, so from, a, from a safety standpoint, from an operation standpoint, to me, it, 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 it looks pretty clear. But I think a lot of actors are definitely still gonna feel like because this came from the US and the US also used its commercial actors to kind of push how we should be thinking about exploitation, which some authors have written that basically that's like a proxy for the state. And if you think of like, say, say like a developing country like Botswana has even less money than an Elon Musk. And so it's kind of like the private actors are acting. It's, it's like they get double power because they get the state and they get the private sector versus another country that just kind of has that state that is lesser. So I think all this to say is with all the Kool-Aid I've drank, I would still say that probably where we've gone with the Artemis Accords is the logical place that we could have gone because it's really, we the Outer Space Treaty was a principled approach. It wasn't detailed and operational enough. So it's always going to have to be that if anyone is going to actually do operational activities, they're going to have to update it and implement it based on the activities that they want to do. And it's going to be coalitions, right? It's going to be the people who have come together and said they want to operate this way. So it's always it was always going to have to be that way. And I think over time, what we're going to see is that we may have only have, I think Poland just signed up last week, but we may have just 12 actors. But I think over time, you're going to find as the activities operationalize and as people want to align with people who are doing activities in space, they're going to sign up to agreements, right? So, so, and I think the way that NASA also did it of kind of like coming in stages. So first of all, kind of being like, there's going to be something called an Artemis Accords and not really telling us what it was, like listening to what the international community said, which of course the first thing they said is, oh my God, this is terrible because it comes from the US. And then after a few weeks kind of saying, okay, here is what it says. Here is a little bit more detailed with the provisions. And each one of those is negotiated with each of the different parties. So each agreement is kind of like, is negotiated between the people who want to be part of this. Right. And so saying that, do is it open? It's open for everyone. But obviously, if you don't want to play in a certain playground, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to. So we'll see what happens with the Russian and Chinese proposal. But I'm sure this is what we call a polycentric governance system where you have different nodes of governance. And what we're going to move towards is seeing, well, how do they speak to each other so that we don't have like fragmentation and like a clash? 
And I think we won't have that because everyone is going to say that it's founded on the Outer Space Treaty. And now I'm going to owe you a drink better than Kool-Aid for that. Uh, thank <laughs> you. And I apologize if I've, Tim, you could, you could probably give my speech, I'll bet, from now on the Artemis Accords. And, and forgive me, but I, I just want to plea again, you know, on the exclusionary zones, right? That, that just as you're describing, I think it's more misperception than reality because we were struggling with that, right? That we absolutely didn't want this to be an exclusionary zone or a keep out zone, but we had to avoid harmful interference in the best that we could come up with. And we almost looked at changing the wording of safety zone because we were concerned that it did carry maybe a, a pejorative or a negative, but in the end, safety was what we were trying to achieve. So we went with it. And again, if you read the accords, you know, there's really two things in the safety zone. There's a transparency and registration requirement. Again, it's more of a burden than a benefit on a country. And that's why people say, well, what if you have a big, you know, safety zone? Well, then it's even more burden on the entity operating because you have to register with the UN, you have to be public what you're doing, and then you have to coordinate with anyone coming into the area per the requirements of the Outer Space Treaty. And then we were explicit that it's not a stay out zone. It's not, uh, you have to respect Article 1 and anyone being able to enter. So we tried to preempt that argument before it happened in the text of the accords itself, but still we kind of live with that, I think, like you say, because you know, of the U.S. association. Um, but boy, we, we tried to do everything possible there. And if there's another way to avoid harmful interference, again, I'd love to hear it, but you know, what we come up with with registration and coordination you know, is the best ways to avoid conflict. And, and then you're absolutely right, too, that you know, because it's a, a quote-unquote U.S. initiative, but, you know, I also try, and you've heard me many times, push back a little bit against that, where the Accords were not just America, but the international partners that were all working on the Artemis program, we're all going to put rovers or whatever on, and we all needed to come together to say, how are we going to do so in a fashion that's peaceful, that's sustainable, and is in line with our existing international obligations? And what is the common ground between us we can all agree to? That's so different than the U.S. position. Um, as you know, I think it was Duncan pointed out, the executive order, like the accords don't say, moon agreement is bad. No one should ever sign the moon agreement, right? That, that would have been a very different scenario. What the accords were via the negotiations with the countries that were participating in Artemis at the time was to try and be an inclusive agreement that would reinforce the international obligations and represented the common ground between all of us, not the U.S. position, because that would have been very important. So yes, we led in a sense that we tried to bring the countries together and you know have probably the lion's share of investment but you know it was a very multilateral process as I, you've heard me mentioned i you know had a lot less gray hair before we not only had eight different space agencies but eight different ministries of foreign affairs all trying to get together and it was virtually consensus right that if anyone didn't like any part it would have to be struck so you know that was and that's why we're afraid that you get diluted to nothing but I think we ended up with a good balance between it moves the ball forward enough to try and implement without, again, creating issues with moon agreement or other treaties. So we tried. And again, I look forward to what others can come up with. And I think that's a great result. But at the very least, we're talking about these issues. And if we can find the common ground even between the accords and what China might do and hopefully resulting in avoiding conflict, which is the ultimate goal of this entire exercise. Yeah, I just want to uh, agree with Mike, and including a uh, comment that Mike said in your introduction, Mike, that um, from my perspective, I, I think the Moon Agreement and, and the Artemis Accords are entirely consistent. Uh, and I think that any uh, state that is a party to the Moon Agreement or, or a signatory to the Moon Agreement could sign up to it. I think it's the executive order is more problematic yes. than the Moon Agreement. Absolutely. Um, yep. and, and, and put states in a, in a sort of uh, Moon Agreement uh, states party in a difficult position. So, so what I mean by that partly is that um, Moon Agreement states might have taken the Artemis Accords as an, as an initiative to hold an assembly of state parties under the Moon Agreement which is something that the Moon Agreement contemplates and, and would lead to the establishment of an international regime. But I think if they had done that in, 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 because of the executive order, that, that would have been difficult um, diplomatically yeah. to do it, that. 
Yes. And by the way, Duncan, it was difficult diplomatically because I think it confused people during the Artemis Accords negotiations when that executive order came out. There was confusion between it, and you still see it today, you know, whether the accords enforce that executive order. And again, the executive order stands as U.S. policy. That's the U.S. position. The accords don't adopt that, though, because it's not the common ground position among the entities. So that did create problems. But to sign the accords, you, of course, don't need to agree to every executive order that the U.S. has put forward. And I appreciate that the U.S. moved forward in that manner that the U.S. wasn't enforcing its position. Instead, the U.S. was looking for the common ground. What is it that a country that signs the Moon Agreement can agree with, with a country that's explicitly opposed? How can we unite and move forward together to establish a peaceful future? And that's what the Accords were intended to accomplish. Thank you so much. I, I knew Artemis would bring up a lot of, of debate and attention. And I just have to say, from the international lawyer perspective, it will be fascinating, and I, I don't know if any of you have any thoughts on this, to see how Artemis and then any other iterations from China, Russia, etc., um, create or fail to create or how long it takes to create uh, some type of customary law. Because, you know, as we see more and more countries looking at Artemis, as we see any other generation of very similar terms, even if created by different partners, then there does tend to start that discussion and dialogue of how far do we go before we do have some element of customary international law that becomes shared and binding on all of the parties, regardless of, of their status as being in a, a, an agreement that was sponsored by China or by Russia, or that was opened up as dialogue by the US. Um, so that's, that's what happens when you ask an international lawyer to do this moderation, David. Anyway, um, we have several other groups of questions and um, the next one, hopefully Duncan will be very much up your alley, which has to do with military um, activities. And we actually have a question in the chat about Space Force, so I think this is a good time to bring it up. Um, and the question is, was Space Force a response to the growing partnership between Russia and China in the space sphere, or was it somehow inevitable that the US was going to create this new branch of its military. Um, and any perspectives would be welcome. But since everyone has heard so much about Space Force, and we don't just mean the yeah. comic show, you know, that was entertaining. Any thoughts? Happy to jump of in. Course. Sorry, oh, go ahead, Mike. Oh, are you sure? <laughs> I'm just stepping on this one. Um, you know, let me just say, relative to you know space force that and i i don't think it was caused by you know the chinese and, and russian uh developments if you look at history and particularly the development of the air force that you had the army air corps previously army is run by who army is run by soldiers and soldiers don't want to invest in planes right and then if you look at space force uh, Air Force was operating Space Force, and I think there's a concern that pilots don't want to invest in space. And I think it's very interesting to look at the historical record, and you see that the arguments that the Air Force was making against the creation of the Space Force was almost the exact same argument, uh, and I mean, almost literally, you could cut and paste, that Army was making against the creation of the Air Force. So you know, if you look at Space Force, I think it was really more of a reaction that it's a procurement play. I mean, this is something that only, I think, attorneys and policy people could love, but the procurement system within Air Force would ultimately not pay the attention to space that I think the political leadership on both sides of the aisle wanted to see, and that's why there had to be an evolution similar to the way that we had to evolve from Army uh, to the Air Force. So I think it was driven more by internal policy and needs and a desire to prioritize space rather than any kind of external you know influence or concerns you know beyond the fact that you know space is becoming more congested competitive and you know that they felt there need to be more of a focus so again i think that was more of an internal than external issue what do you think Doug? <laughs> yeah i absolutely agree and in, in fact um i was going to say it's a sort of perennial and common observation among military forces around the world that things 
tend to be platform centric. They're too platform centric. Um, whereas, especially in the modern world, they ought to be more plat platform agnostic. And so to use, um, you know, a, a symposium like this as an example, no doubt people are participating in, in this symposium on PCs, Macs, Chromebooks, desktops, laptops, HP, Dell, Lenovo, whatever. The platform doesn't and shouldn't matter. And by analogy, there should be more what we call jointery in military forces. And in fact, it, it kind of, in a way, a little bit of a shock uh, when the Space Force was formed in the US because the perception is that um, the US already has problems among its services in, in operating jointly and then to establish another force is, is just incredible. But, but military for, uh, platforms, including space infrastructure, represent enormous public expenditure. And so um, being platform centric is, is, is quite inevitable because of that, because it, it, it involves enormous public expenditure. Um, having said that, uh, there, there did need to be some impetus for uh, beyond the fact that it, it's platform centric. There, there did need to be some impetus to say, um, we need to invest in some significant platforms, space related platforms. Uh, and that impetus was probably China. China was, was um, a large part of that. Having said that, I think the military industrial complex probably fed the fires and continues to feed the fires somewhat. You know, any opportunity that is available to say, yes, what China is doing is scary and we should produce more platforms and we can sell you more platforms um, is a natural thing. So, um, uh, in part, in part it, it's inevitable. In, in part, there, there had to be a little bit of emphasis. I also I want think, to say. I think, I think that um, that said, even though they've been talking about space forces for decades, like it's not a new thing, but under the Trump administration, the rhetoric was, you know, we're really saying space is now a war fighting domain. Like all those people who had thought of space as a sanctuary before, or, you know, I think I might, might have got this from one of your slides, Duncan, but like the different eras that we've had of like how we characterize space. And now we're saying it's a war fighting domain. And so some of the questions was really, is it the chicken or the egg situation? Is it the US coming in and saying it's a war fighting domain that's making everyone act in a domino effect? Or was it actually happening? And then the US was like in a response. And of course, what the Trump administration was saying was that this was in response to our adversaries making space a war fighting domain. And then after that, you now had France and Canada and all these different actors, the UK now saying, okay, we are going to set up specific arms of the military to kind of focus on this idea. But once you have the main primary actor declaring, this is as a place that you need to protect your assets, everyone has to respond. And so as Professor Jack Hu and Joseph Pelton say, it was a domino effect that was created and now, you know, you can't really be a serious actor if you don't talk about how you're going to safeguard your assets. Sorry to interrupt you, Mike. No, please, especially on this issue. Thank you. Because I agree with everything you said. And I, I just hope and I pray that we, we should not view conflict as inevitable in space. I, I just can't and will never accept that. I, I want humanity desperately to do better in space than we have here on Earth. And I think space connects us in a way that no other realm does. And, you know, while there's space force and military activity, I'm not Pollyannish to say that there isn't that kind of thing going on. This is where I think it's up to us in you know, academics and diplomats and, and lawyers to be proactive to, again, prevent conflict before it occurs. And just talking about the Artemis Accord, so that's the civil space, you know, political commitment. There are two other areas that we need, I think, similar traction. And that's one on commercial, that we need kind of an Artemis Accords for commercial activities, but also for national security, that we need to have agreed upon norms and behavior to prevent that conflict. How close is too close? I don't think we've got an international agreement on that yet. And you can see how that could so easily lead to conflict, that one country could think that something's acceptable and another thinks it's an act of war. 
And I think it's incumbent upon Space Force and Department of State and, and America you know, should lead, but others you know, should as well, to try and create a global effort, like with the Accords, to say what are the norms of behavior here that we should follow in order to prevent conflict. And we haven't done that yet. And it scares me that we haven't done that yet because national security actions are so rife for misinterpretation or misperception. So I hope we could have a Accords-like effort uh, for national security in this country and in others, and then have a global agreement in terms of how close is too close, what you know is jamming, et cetera, to, again, avoid conflict before it occurs. I think Duncan had highlighted the um, the UK led new working group, yes. right? So, like yes. Duncan, what what is supposed to come out of that? Uh, yeah, so the open ended working group on on um, norms for for space. Uh, we don't have all the detail yet. It'll, it'll happen in twenty twenty three and twenty twenty four. Uh, well, sorry, two meetings in 2022 and 2023, I think, they're, they're in each of those. Um, so other previous UN efforts, uh, for example, on, on transparency and confidence building measures have not come to substantive conclusions. So there's reasons to be apprehensive about what the open-ended working group will uh, achieve, but um, the previous effort where the UK sponsored a, a resolution asking for states to uh, report to the Secretary General on, on what they believed were important norms to establish did result in a lot of states committing to saying, we think it's important to establish these norms. Um, those are, abs they're all absolutely um, essential. Uh, I, I think so, so I've previously written on this, and I, I think if you could imagine a scenario, it, it, quite often it's about the narrative in respect of international law. It, it's the battle for legitimacy. If you can win the battle for legitimacy, you don't have to fight the real fight, right? So imagine that you could say, uh, and, and this is somewhat of an ideal, in respect of something that looks to be like, a, like an irresponsible behaviour in outer space, we know you did it, so there's attribution. We can demonstrate to the satisfaction of the international community that you did it, so there's verifiability. Um, there is a normative framework that applies, and that, uh, so there's legitimacy, and, and, and it's clear, so there's clarity. Um, we have the capability to impose the consequences, and, and when I say we, I mean the international community, not necessarily one particular state. Um, and, and those consequences would be effective and they wouldn't have significant impacts on us. There'd be minimum recoil. Now, if you could say that as a matter of a, an international narrative, that would be pretty powerful. But when you listen to what I, I said, the attribution, verifiability, normative framework, legitimacy, clarity, capability, effectiveness, minimum recoil, you can see that's somewhat of an ideal and we never get um, 100 percent of that ideal um, but if we can get closer to 100 percent of that that ideal it could be effective I'll just chime in real quick to say you know if if it ever were to come to an actual conflict between the united states and one of its um say nation state adversaries versus and one of its spacefaring nation state adversaries in particular, that I, I, I think the space domain would, would absolutely be involved in that. To Mike, to, to your point earlier, you know, uh, about we don't, you know, necessarily recognize how big uh, a factor in our everyday live space is until the GPS goes down, that would absolutely be one of the, the first targets would be taking out our, our networks and, and other uh, capabilities that are um, really enabled by our space assets. And yeah, I, I just, uh, I, 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 I fear the day, right, when, when uh, a, a, a terrorist organization would have some sort of launch capability because that would, I, I think that would be the, the end of, um, you know, the ability to rely 
on you know the 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 safety the the sanctuary that we've all uh, kind of you know built these dreams and hopes on. Does everyone think that? Does everyone think that if we made space um, critical infrastructure, like some people are calling for, like they do in the UK, that would make a difference? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Samara, but like, would because right now it's not designated as like national infrastructure, critical infrastructure, so it's not protected in the same way. And some people are calling for if we get that official designation, it gets to be protected kind of in a different way. So I don't know. Sorry, Samara, please go ahead. Yeah, and, and, and this is this is an important uh, conversation, but I, I will um, remind folks that why NASA came into being um, and what the first part of the Space Act uh, uh, talks about as its purpose. Uh, we yes, we do now have the Space Force. But NASA came into being because there was a concern about military activity and about Russian uh, 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 being first in space. Uh, NASA's history, we started off as a, uh, with um, military personnel who helped us to develop our rockets. We understand that. But at the time um, we were created in 1958, um, the opening of this, the Space Act talks about Tong Congress declaring the policy of the United States uh, to be devoted to peaceful purposes for the benefit of all mankind. And we are still doing that. That's our purpose. So while there is a space force, I'll just submit uh, to you that as Mike was discussing and saying, I hope we don't get to this place. I think uh, all of us hope we don't get to the, this place where space is some military um, uh, playground. But um, think about what, what NASA, what the European Space Agency, what, what the Nigerian Space Agency, what we are all trying to do is use space for peaceful purposes. And I think as, as, uh, as we maybe see military issues growing, this is where it is going to become important for those, uh, those government entities uh, who have peaceful purposes to, uh, to, to maybe flex their muscles. I'll just uh, go back to Einstein's quote real quick, maybe, you know, uh, don't necessarily know what weapons will be used in World War III, but if it ever comes to World War IV, that, that would be sticks and stones, right? So it, if, it, it, if, if there is that level of conflict, I can't imagine that, you know, our access to space would, would survive that because that whole Kessler syndrome thing would, I think, would be part of that equation in a very bad way. Definitely. It's, I mean, it's, you know, it's a movie, but on the other hand, it's absolutely not a movie. And I think that's what more people need to understand. And that's why we, it's so important to have this dialogue so that we don't just think of it as, you know, something you see in the theater and then you leave it home, but it actually is something that is much more prescient. Um, Duncan, I have been asked to inquire of you as to the Lumera Manual Project. So if you might actually give us a little taste of what it is and how it might work. Yes. So um, I said in my introduction that uh, I, I think saying space is a, is a new wild west is, is simplistic. Quite often that phrase is used to indicate that, that it's relatively lawless. And I reject that um, characterization. I think there's actually a lot of law that applies to, to space, including in respect of military activities in outer space. Now, you might have something like Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols that set out laws of armed conflict that don't specifically use the word outer space. That there, there are some aspects of, of um, laws of armed conflict that do specifically use the phrase, but, but not very much. But that's not to say that it doesn't apply. Uh, and it's important to, to be clear about how it applies in outer space. So the Woomera Manual Project is, is about achieving clarity and it's about getting global experts together. And, and the idea is to produce a convenient um, 
volume. So it, it, it's not necessarily a new idea. There was the San Remo Manual on International Law Applicable to Armed Conflict at Sea, the Harvard Manual on International Law Applicable to Air and Missile Warfare, the Tallinn Manual on um, International Law Applicable to Cyber Warfare. And the idea is that you have, rather than if, if you're a military legal officer or a JAG like me, and, and not just the, the lawyers, it, it, they're meant to be practical resources. You have one place to look for all of the applicable law and for a commentary on the law. And, and, and that means that it, it gets uh, a level of authority by virtue of being convenient. So it, it's, it's not law. We're not seeking to create law. You know, Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice talks about treaties, customary international law, general principles of law, and as a subsidiary means the writings of the most highly qualified publicists. Those are your sources of law, but we don't assume to be any of those. It's just a matter of convenience all in this one volume. And you have these experts that come together from all over the world. It's important that the experts are not there in an official capacity, because as soon as they're there in an official capacity, they're obliged to represent the official position. And the, the discussion will sort of get bogged down, if you like, um, from that. And so the idea is uh, that the manual has something like 120 succinct rules. And an example would be um, a, a satellite can't be, you know, I, I can't, I'm not quoting exactly, but the, the, the gist of a rule might be a satellite can't be a considered legitimate military objective unless it um, meets these criteria. And the criteria are set out in, in for example, additional protocol one. So stuff about being, um, effective uh, for military activities of your adversary, and there's an advantage to to um, to destroying it. Um, it's a pretty strict test. I, I probably haven't done justice to it. You, you have a very succinct statement, and then you have several pages of commentary on it, so, so that you understand. And there's 120 rules like that, or thereabouts. Um, so that's that's what it's about, um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer other questions about it. Excellent, and I, I can speak to this a little bit because um, I'm one of the expert reviewers of the McGill manual, and from what I really saw of it, it was like kind of like we we're saying, it's not about what the law should be, it's a real statement of like, what is the actual situation, which means, which is really an interesting point um, that I want to put to you, Duncan, because when we make these statements of what the law is in a situation where we're already unclear about it, how does it actually help us address the actual issues? Because the whole reason we want to do it is because we're not sure. And so does it actually take us to a position where it does clarify or like, so what do you think this actually brings to helping us and have a better understanding of what the situation is? Yeah, look, I, I think it, uh, so it is intended to produce clarity. It, it, as you say, it, it, it's not about stating, you know, the Latin uh, phrases, it, it, it's not lex ferenda, it's not what you want the law to be, it's lex lata, what the law actually is. There is a lack of clarity, and that's um, manifested in, in the number of um, uh, circumstances where you've heard it said by senior leaders that the space is a new Wild West. Uh, that simply isn't true. We, we, so we do need clarity, and, and um, like the phrase says, good fences make good neighbours. If you've got clarity about things, then there's less likely to be conflict. If, you, if you've got clarity about the norms, then you can say to someone else, if you're talking about use ad bellum, so the law about decisions to go to war, if you do that, it is almost certainly going to be characterised as an armed conflict, sorry, as an armed attack. And by virtue of Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations, there is a right to respond in national self-defence, which is not necessarily to say 
that you're going to respond in outer space in, in national self-defence. But by being clear about that, then it's less likely you're going to have states pushing the bounds, if you like, because they know where the bounds are and they know what the consequences are. And that's, that's pretty important. And if it does get to armed conflict that involves outer space, then it's good that there is recognition that, for example, um, creating a lot of space debris, creating collateral damage and collateral effects in outer space isn't just something that impacts your adversary, it affects the whole globe. And, and you are obliged to take that into account. You're obliged not just to consider what effect you're trying to have on your adversary, but the impact that you're going to have on the civilian population as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Duncan. It, it really, it's a fascinating project. It's a fascinating idea. And uh, I think it can do so much good for, for so many different aspects of space. So thank you. Um, and finally, we move to um, the more private sector, um, which we touched on, I think, in the beginning, and then really would be remiss if we didn't come back to towards the end. Um, and this idea of not only having a regulatory, uh, a governmental regulatory and military control aspect, but also having um, what some are calling space tourism or the idea of a new space race as being centered on those with a great deal of money, a great deal of access to influence, um, being able to carry out different types of um, touristic activities or exploration activities. Um, and Timmy, you mentioned the quote from Fitz William, who it was very adamant that this is perhaps not the way that um, billionaires such as Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos should be spending their money. Um, how does this argument influence the idea of, um, of space exploration, space tourism? Um, do you think it is a legitimate argument? Um, and I, I know that um, David and I were discussing yesterday the fact that in the wake of this type of criticism on Monday, it was announced that uh, Jeff Bezos would be giving $2 billion to counter uh, or help remediate deforestation in the, the climate change sector, um, many see that as potentially a response to the public outcry that came after his space exploration activities. Um, so what are your thoughts on this? And then just real quick, and, and then Elon Musk comes out and says, I'll give yeah. six billion for world hunger. Which I mean, in a way isn't bad, right? Because we're getting resources one way or the other, we're getting resources, so it's a good thing. Um, but thoughts from anyone? I, I, I'll jump in and say, look, I, I think um, Bezos, Branson, Musk have been singled out for the wrong reasons. I think there are reasons why they should be singled out, but they've been singled out for the wrong reasons. Um, and what I mean by that is that, um, you know, what they are potentially doing in, in outer space is, is great because we do need outer space to face um, planet-sized challenges like climate change. We need to understand planetary science. We need Earth observation. We need communications. Uh, and, and also we need the overview effect, and Jeff Be Bezos made reference to that. But um, we also need to recognise, and this is, you know, sort of recognising the flaws that we all have and the deficiencies that we all have, um, we all consume. It's, it, it's, it's not just... Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson and others who are responsible for this, but I'm responsible and you're responsible. We're all responsible for this. Um, and Jeff Bezos, you know, as the founder of Amazon, will tell me who's consumed something via Amazon recently. Uh, there is a, a great podcast um, by uh, that I, I listened to recently, uh, Dr. Natasha Hurley Walker, um, called a, a podcast called Occam's Razor. And she started with a premise that if economic growth is to continue at 2% uh, every year, as, as, as um, many economists say it should, then, uh, and if we assume a linear relationship between consumption, especially energy consumption and economic growth, she's an astrophysicist and she did the maths essentially. And she said, within a couple of hundred years, 
there would not be enough energy in the solar system to feed the economic growth. Within a couple of millennia, there wouldn't even be enough energy in the entire universe to feed economic growth. Now, the answer to that might be, um, you know, green growth economics, where they're saying, can you de-link um, uh, economic growth from consumption? And I think intuitively, everybody would have to say that doesn't seem likely. Um, the alternatives are degrowth and, and post-growth economics, but now I'm sort of getting beyond uh, myself a bit and, and I know into the realm of um, Alexander and, and Timmy Evie. But um, so, uh, you know, I think Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Richard Branson have been singled out for the wrong reasons. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to say I've dedicated my entire life to the dream of space and space exploration. I believe in my soul in the value of scientific discovery that this human urge, not only to ask questions, but to find new questions is the best of what humanity is in so many ways. And I also believe that by going to space, not only will we learn more about our universe and where we came from and where we're headed, but that there are new technologies. I mean, if it wasn't for space, we couldn't have this conversation. The world would be a much larger and lonelier place that we will find ways, and particularly in microgravity research and development, and this is one of the things that got me out of NASA, that micrograv will open up a whole new world of scientific and commercial possibilities for research, development, manufacturing. I believe by going to space, we will find new ways to heal the sick. We'll find new ways to feed the hungry. And that by going to space, we not only will learn about the universe and ourselves, but improve the human condition in so many ways. Again, I'm probably biased because I've just always had this I, you know, is there a vaccine for that, right? The space train, and maybe not everyone shares that, but I remember when I was in Russia on the launch campaigns, and my Russian colleague was complaining that our billionaires buy yachts, years build space companies. And I just see tremendous benefit there. If you look at what SpaceX has done to revolutionize costs, I mean, you saved at least the American taxpayer billions and billions of dollars with these new dynamic systems. The strides we'll be able to make in science and climate change and astronomy due to the lower launch costs, I think, will be tremendous. And I think if you're Elon or, you know, Bezos or, or Richard Branson, if you just wanted to make money, there's probably a lot sure ways than investing in space, you know, such as lighting the money on fire. The old joke began, if you want to make a small fortune in space, how do you do it? You begin with a large fortune. And... I, I almost, and, and tell me if I'm going over a line, but you know, these investments are virtually altruistic. And the reason that they're commercial is the extent that they want, these founders want it to be sustainable, you know, beyond them to achieve the broader goals of, as Elon says, becoming a multi-planet species and Bezos' dream of thousands of people living and working in space. And that's in no way, shape, or form to dilute or in any way take away from um, wealth inequality, which is extraordinarily important, and I don't want to say it's not, but I, I don't think that attacking these entrepreneurs who are helping humanity move forward into the cosmos and we can find new cures for diseases and new developments and new technologies, I think that's misplaced, and I applaud the investments that these entrepreneurs have made. I hope that we'll see more in the future. You know what, I sit in the College of Global Futures at ASU, which is the school ranked number one for innovation. And we have three schools in my college, the School for Complex Adaptive Systems, the School for Sustainability, and the School for the Future of Innovation in Society. And it's really interesting sitting there because obviously space is a complex adaptive system. We have to think about sustainability and we need to think of the societal implications. And everywhere I go, I get faced with this question of the fact that Innovation is something that we've always thought of as going to save us, or is like, you know, the area that if we keep progressing, kind of like we will find all these solutions. 
But I think we space people have to be really, really careful about this because I remember when Elon was first coming out with, we need to leave, we need to be able to explore other universes because Earth is doomed. And I think many of us that come from the sustainability and environmental lens will immediately have problems with that because it's like, why would you say that we shouldn't safeguard the place where we're at that is actually made for us and say we should run away because we know because of inequality, if we're really running away because Earth is destroyed, then all the marginalized societies are going to be the ones left on, you know, left in space. Or, you know, so so I think we just have to be really careful about that narrative and really ensuring that, you know, when we think about progress and we think about technological solutions, we realize when we look at the climate change issue, it's it's not lack of technology that's making us have a problem in the climate sphere. It's the fact that we're not doing behavior change, right? Like we're not doing what we need to do. And so even though I think it's a real shame that you know, they got all that negative press because they were really doing something good. I think we have to be really careful with the language to ensure that, you know, so many people are left behind that like, you know, when Richard Branson came up and they just had that big party and it was like COVID and Black Lives Matter, it's kind of, you know, it was like tone deaf a little bit. So as we move forward, we always have to make sure front and center, we recognize we know there are all these issues going on. This is how space contributes. This is what we're really doing and ensure that that conversation is front line and center. Absolutely, no, definitely. And, and it really is so much about narrative and so much about also those who are innovating, innovating in a way where the innovation is the focus rather than the person and rather than what the person is doing. So I think you're absolutely right with the, you know, the parties and everything else, it's lovely. Um, if you're enjoying the parties and the food, but at the same time, it doesn't just hurt you, it hurts the entire mission of, of space exploration. Um, so I have been told, and amazingly, we are at the point in the program where we're going to do one final question to all of you from me, and then I will be mercifully very quiet and pass over to David and Julia who have questions from the audience. Um, but the last question kind of is a bit of a re reflective one for all of you. And that is you all work in um, education or policy uh, discussions where you, you interact with students and mentees and advisees. Um, and what would you say to students who are listening today or who are listening to the recording in the future um, to learn more about and potentially to specialize in space thought, you know, if they're interested, what would you say to them um, as a career path or as, you know, do it or run away as quickly as you can, which I doubt anyone would say, but, um, you know, what is your advice for anyone who is interested in, in pursuing space law? I'll chime in real quickly and, and, you know, I think folks can gather from the conversation here today with all of these really incredible um, peers on, on the panel that um, the, the subtleties and complexities uh, are, are just rife and it, it is ultimately um, a very rewarding endeavor to tackle space you know head on as a, you know a, a practicing space lawyer or even just as an aspect uh, of the overall practice that, that you engage in and I'll, I'll just go back to what I said earlier I'm you know a big proponent of interdisciplinary kind of multidisciplinary uh, kind of approaches so don't feel like you know you have to have a particular background to approach space or space law, um, you can leverage your own experience and expertise to date to, to um, uh, you know, bring a new lens um, to the conversation. And one of the things that we didn't really get into a whole bunch was really around cultural heritage. And there are space anthropologists out there and there are, you know, there's all good space architects. And so I would just encourage everyone to, to consider it because it's really rewarding. I think for me, I would say the best thing that ever happened to my space law career was studying environmental law. And what I mean by that is to say that, you know, I'd been studying space, 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 
And then when you get into the space community, you see there are a lot of people that have tunnel vision. They've been working on this specific thing their whole life. When I went out, I went to the climate change conventions. I was like studying other global governance regimes. You now have so many fresh perspectives that you can bring to the space world. And now in space, we're at the point where it's all about opening up and trying to mainstream it. So we need ideas from other areas. So even though it's super hard to get a space job, every job, any job that you do, focus on being the best that you can be in that job, get the best insights you can, because when you finally get the opportunity to get into space, I tell you, you will be completely unique and you will bring that insight into the space world. So whatever you get, do the best you can, always be the best and it will be appreciated in the space world. So I guess I'll go next and, and I'll advocate. Yeah, if you are if you are in law school and early in law school, look on the Office of the General Counsel website. We have uh, internship opportunities, and our interns go on and do great things. AKA Mike Gold. Look at where he is today. There is no better poster child for the uh, NASA, NASA uh, intern program than Mike. Uh, but we have many other students. Uh, there are organizations and students can join and participate in. The International Astronautical Congress. As part of that, the IISL runs the Manfred Locks Moot Court Competition. And we have schools from all around the country who participate. Uh, I have been a judge uh, and Mike has been a judge on uh, that moot court competition. Uh, SGAC, Space Gen uh, Advisory Council, a group of students, early career folks who are interested in space. And uh, absolutely, I agree with um, Professor Akanaba, be competent. I also agree with Professor Woods when he said, experiment, learn different things, try different things. Uh, that's what I would encourage students to do. I was a poli-sci major who didn't take a science degree. And people think I'm smart now because I work for NASA. So you just bring those skills that you have uh, because they need all of the skills, space programs, space activities, um, it's innovation. And what they're really looking for are people who are innovative thinkers. And if you listen to all the panelists here, people are innovative thinkers, they're creative, they, they, they're looking for people who wanna be included because as I listen to each and every one of the speakers today, um, that theme I talked about of inclusion, you heard it in everybody's remarks. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I guess I would just uh, back up on uh, what everybody else has said. Uh, to put it succinctly, I'd say um, do a little bit of sp space law, go out and do something um, related to space law afterwards uh, and, and get some experience in that and then come back to space law later uh, and and in terms of doing things that are related I, i've heard it said that you know within 10 years as, as many as 50 percent of the jobs globally will be space related jobs in in some way or another it's going to be a broad range of things you, as, as as i think stephen said you can have architects accountants physiotherapists that all have a space component to to their work so you can go and uh, get go out there and um, work for a startup that that has you know a component of space in what they do and then you can come back to space law later and you'll be richer for it so that's what I'd recommend yeah, I guess what I would tell a student is don't underestimate your impact as an attorney that what you do as a lawyer will be again as important to space development and exploration as what any engineer or scientist will do. And again, I saw it up front that, you know, Samara's role as general counsel, that what, you know, you do, Samara, and, you know, you know, it is just as important, if not more so, to achieving the goal of what NASA is trying to do than the AA for the Human Exploration Operations than any of your technical colleagues, that it's so important. And again, I saw that up front uh, at NASA and my compliments to my colleagues and all of us you know, in the legal community who have made this dream of space uh, become a reality. And 
you know, pursue your passion that I think too many of us uh, or too many students give up that they don't think they can make it in space or that there isn't a place for them in space. And they give up in their passion and go into other fields. The beauty of space, and particularly with all the options you have now, I mean, when I graduated, there was no SpaceX, there was no Blue Origin, there was no really commercial you know, sector, at least not like it is today, that you were either going to NASA or going to a large prime, which are both terrific options. Uh, but there's so many more opportunities today. And whether you're an export control attorney or if your passion is employment law, again, look at Samara's resume, you've done so, there's so many different things you can do and contribute. So regardless of your skill, and I would even broaden that out beyond attorneys. I mean, if your passion is accounting, there's a place for you in space. If you're an artist, there's a place for you in space. That you can contribute regardless of what your skill set is if you have that passion. And then the final piece of advice I would give to a young student is if you're in Dubai at the International Astronautical Congress, don't go on an ATV. Don't do it. Avoid the ATV. Don't go anywhere as close to the ATV. So. Well, on the absolutely brilliant and cautionary note, thank you very much, all of you. <laughs> and I will now very happily turn over uh, control of the floor to David and to Julia for some of our audience questions. Thank you. And thank you so much to our panelists, as well as our moderator. This was a fantastic conversation. I almost feel like there needs to be a part two to this, but we'll, we'll look into that later. But I, I cannot thank you all enough. Um, we do have a few audience questions. Um, I am going to start right from uh, the top which um, actually starts with, uh, it's kind of going back into the private section. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, they ask, how has the entrance of private actors, SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, um, affected the development of space law? This is the private sector wrap up. I'm happy to jump in on that one. Uh, it's really been challenging in a number of ways for space law, this evolution of commercial space, and really what's the second golden age of space exploration driven by these new commercial entities. And I think the first aspect is the international, as well as the domestic system, was not established to be able to reflect this reality of the outsized role that commercial entities are playing. There's no seat at United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space for SpaceX, you know, or for other companies. So we really need to find ways to integrate commercial space players into the overarching diplomatic, international, and legal system to ensure that we're proceeding in a safe, peaceful, and prosperous fashion, not just for those entities, but for all uh, of humanity to enjoy. And similarly, we have to develop rules and regulations that encourage innovation and development, but again, as we talk about the debris and, and LEO, preserve the environment. And unfortunately, often policy lags behind technology. And again, I go back to that's why the roles of the policymakers, the attorneys, people in insurance, et cetera, is so important because often that's playing catch up to what the engineers have done. Thank you. Um, we have a would, question. Just real quick, I would I would just uh, say as well, um, to the point earlier about this is not the Wild West, the Outer Space Treaty equally applies to those commercial entities. So the nation state has to authorize, supervise, exercise jurisdiction and control. So people often think that the space actors are outside of that regime, but they're not. Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, which, by the way, and Samara's probably tired of hearing me say this, is everyone, we still got work to do on that one in the U.S., and specifically identifying an agency that's responsible for particularly the continuing supervision aspects of Article 6. So quite right. Sorry. Thank you so much. Um, Stephen asks, something that has bothered him about the United States Space Command is the classification of China's satellite repair robotic arm. Um, as a threat. However, we have, uh, we have emerging, if not active technologies along the same line. Couldn't that be considered space colonization? Uh, 
space colonization. I, I, not sure about that. The the robotic arms. The, the point about um, you know states saying states being critical of other states about what those states are doing and yet doing the same things themselves. Well, you know, welcome to the world of international relations. States do that all the time. Um, and, and it is true, for example, um, anti-satellite testing, testing of anti-satellite weapons is, is something that Russia and the US did up until the, I think the early eighties uh, and subsequently um, the US and, and Russia have been critical of say the Indians doing a test in 2019 um, of anti-satellite weapons. And then shortly after the Chinese did a test, of course, there was Operation Burnt Frost by the US, which ostensibly wasn't a test of, an, of an anti-satellite weapon, but um, it certainly demonstrated that the US had an anti-satellite capability. So yes, that, that sort of thing happens quite often. And it's part of the battle for legitimacy that happens between states all the time. And what, one of the frustrating aspects of it in, in, the, in, the, um, in the space domain, for example, is in the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which is, um, there's the main committee and two subcommittees. There's a legal subcommittee and a, and a technical subcommittee. States are very fond of um, telling each other off for things that are not peaceful uses of outer space, notwithstanding that, that you know, the, the term peaceful use of outer space actually appears only in the preamble of the Outer Space Treaty, plus in Article 4, which is specific to the moon and other celestial bodies, but they don't really engage in the, the legal debate. It's an opportunity to... to you know, score political points, if you like. Um, so there is a battle for legitimacy going on. That's true. And look, we're all going to have arms in orbit, right? I mean, my company next year will be deploying a system that not only has robotic arms to assemble itself, but 3D printers where the satellite builds itself in orbit. Again, we're looking, it's called the Arcanaut uh, Project, and we've got this new era, again, of robotics and satellites merging. So this is all coming. I think the issue is not that there's a robotic arm in orbit, it's what you're doing with that arm and where your spacecraft is going. And as we discussed, this is why it's so important now to lay down the norms behavior, to understand when you cross that boundary from a peaceful activity to a threatening activity. And if we can have this conversation globally, hopefully we can prevent the kind of conflict in space that we all fear and capture the kind of future that we all want. Thank you. Um, we have a question that was sort of based off of the first hour when we were discussing um, the OST and the United Nations. Um, Wendy Williams from New Zealand asks, are there consequences written into these space treaties and agreements if countries and organizations break them? And David followed up saying, if there are consequences, is there a reliable enforcement mechanism in place for them? So I think it's a terrific question, and at least to the best uh, of my There opinion. are consequences, not necessarily. Go ahead, Duncan, please. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, sorry. So I was just going to, well, I'm going to say that I... Uh, least... as, as you're saying, um, so there's, there's not consequences necessarily directly the out of space treaty, um, but there are consequences in other areas of international law. So principles of state responsibility are all, all about um, obligations to pay compensation, for example, or make reparation um, or, or re restitution. Um, but also, of course, there's no international police force. So how does the international community police itself? Well, it polices itself by having clarity about norms. And also, um, previously, I sort of referred to a list of things that ideally you would have in order to have effective narratives between states that, that um, enforced responsible behavior in outer space. You'd, you'd want to have attribution, verifiability, a clear normative framework. You, you, you'd need some states with the ability to impose consequences. Um, and if you have those things, then 
um, then you have consequences. You, you have a enforceable regime, but it is difficult in the international sphere. It's, it's not like the domestic sphere where you have a police force. I want to say when it is a terrific question because while you know I'm such a huge fan of the Outer Space Treaty, I don't want to say the lack of consequences is a flaw, but at least it's a challenge that there were no consequences or are no consequences to violation. And it was actually something that we were trying to do with the Artemis Accords that for the first time there actually is a consequence. At the very least, that if a nation isn't willing to avoid harmful interference, isn't registering, isn't respecting sustainable resources, isn't interoperable, isn't mitigating debris, isn't releasing their scientific data, you can't be a part of the program. So it may not be much, but at least we were trying to create some sort of consequence that if you don't follow the tenets of the Outer Space Treaty, at the very least, you can't be a part of the Artemis Coalition exploring the moon. So we tried to do a little something of that, but you're absolutely right that that lack of consequences is an existential issue that I think we're still struggling with today. Thank you. Uh, Scott asks, thinking beyond the next 10 years or so, without national territory, territorial sovereignty on the moon or Mars, uh, will settlements or cities in space be extensions of the nations um, where they're from, or will there be a means in law for self-government by those settlements? Well, uh, Starlink's terms, terms of service say that, uh, you know, there's... Uh, I just want to jump in quickly here. Go ahead, Duncan. <laughs> we got to... We gotta oh, I was just going to make a quick point that um, both Australia and the US have um, experience with a, a colonial sort of power having, uh, having remote governance over us, and we decided that we didn't like it. Um, the reason I, I raise that analogy is because you can imagine the Martians in the future saying, well, why should we be governed by United States law or Australian law or whatever? We should have our own law. Um, like I say, the US and Australia both have experience of that. and We decided we didn't like it. And that, uh, as I was saying, the Starlink Terms of Service already include a provision that states that no earthly government has any authority over, uh, you know, activities on Mars. So theoretically, you know, maybe not, um, uh, you know, uh, valid under international space law, but we'll see how it plays. Thank you. This was sent to me by an anonymous attendee. They say Blue Origin and Sierra Space announced plans for or orbital, re orbital reef, excuse me, a commercially developed, owned, and operated space station to be built in low Earth orbit. Why is this considered the next chapter in human, human space exploration? This one's for you, Mike, right? I mean, I'm offended that uh, you're leaving out red wire in the question and Boeing. So. <laughs> Really appreciate it. And the ASU. <laughs> and ASU, exactly. And AWS and Amazon. So, geez, it's a, it, it is an ecosystem, right? <laughs> that we're trying to build and there's a lot of people participating. So I, I don't want to say, you know, you say it's the next uh, evolution in space exploration. It's a very important part of the overall space development and growth. And we've seen the evolution of the commercial paradigm where you have the private sector first sending cargo to the International Space Station, now more recently crew. And this is the next step in that, with the private sector actually developing and deploying a platform in low Earth orbit that can service not just uh, American or NASA needs, but the global needs of the International Space Station Coalition and hopefully many more countries than were even involved in the ISS. So the beauty of the orbital reef is hopefully to lower costs, expand participation globally, and honor the incredible heritage and accomplishments of the International Space Station. While, again, the technological success of the ISS is unparalleled, I'm, of course, going to focus on the diplomatic success of the International Space Station, how it's brought the world together. I've always argued that the ISS should get a Nobel Peace Prize. I think we take for granted that, you know, for every day, and, and some, David, probably for you and some of the other students, your entire lives 
there's been a station in space yeah. crewed by an international group built by a global coalition with, I think, well over 100 different nations having uh, conducted experiments on. We take that for granted too much. That's amazing. And, you know, the Samara and people like Melanie Saunders and the attorneys and diplomats, Karen Feldstein, you know, everyone who worked on these creating the International Space Station is amazing. We cannot let that dream die. We need to keep the torch lit. And that's why it's so important that we have successor stations that are international, not just for the scientific and exploration benefits, but because the way space brings us together in a fashion that no other endeavor can. But now let's turn it back over to ASU, our other partner there in uh, Orbital Reef. Yeah, definitely. I think what is really interesting and exciting is that it's not just, you know, in this era of space, we're really talking about transdisciplinarity, but also multi-stakeholderism. So ASU's Interplanetary Initiative leads um, the Orbital Reef University Advisory Council, which is a consortium of more than a dozen international universities. And basically this group will establish guidelines and standards for conduct for ethical research on the station, provide consulting to those new to space research, channel academic research into orbital reef and form academic user experiences. So it's really exciting because at the Interplanetary Initiative, we're really all about, it's, it's like a university wide space mission. And it's really all about saying, no longer can we operate in silos. Every actor, every institution has a role to play if we're really gonna become an interplanetary species. And the university has a strong role to play because we create that ground where everyone can actually come to the table and feel comfortable that this is a societal goal that is being advanced. So we're really excited to be part of this project and you know, it's up from here. Incredible, thank you. Um, Abdul asks, we have to mitigate space debris. Uh, but one thing that is still lingering in their mind is, is there a way to change our space design of our, our space vehicles in order to re, uh, reduce the introduction of new space debris? I mean, absolutely. There's a variety of engineering changes, technical solutions that should be adopted to address the debris issue. Some are as simple as putting labeling that we can be able to identify pieces of space debris or find them or transponders to know where they are to something more complex like, you know, Redwire's working on in terms of having space-based robotics, orbital servicing assembly manufacturing systems that could collect and even utilize the debris. So there's both passive technological changes that we should be doing and the more active technological development, leveraging robotics in space and what we call OSAM to oh, deal with the debris okay. issue. So I think there's a variety of technological fixes we absolutely need okay. to do to deal with the issue. She, because we're, we're going now. Thank you, thank you. Um, the next question that we have is uh, to Professor Wood. Uh, from a fellow past geology and astronomy student, did you know that you wanted to go into STEM-related law field or did it just line up that way? I think I typed my answer to that one, David, so we can uh, line up the next one. Perfect. Um, this is an anonymous question. Uh, will the system around Artemis cause delays or create unnecessary competition? Furthermore, because of the absence, I believe, of China and Russia, uh, won't it take longer for the UN to authorize Artemis missions, causing delays for the United States and other nations who have signed the Artemis Accord? So I'm not quite sure if I follow that question entirely. You know, the United Nations doesn't authorize missions, and that's why it was so important with the Artemis program moving forward that we ensure that Artemis-related activities are conducted safely, peacefully, and in a fashion that complies with our existing international agreements, as well as, again, norms of behavior, such as the free, free open you know, release of scientific data. Relative to the UN, you know, the goal is whether it's a country that's participating in Artemis and has signed the Artemis Accords, and then brings information about well, this is how we implemented safety zones and it worked well here, didn't work well here, or this is how we tried to preserve heritage and, and this is what we learned that you have to stay a certain distance away. I, I hope that ourselves, as well as China and Russia and other nations, 
bring that experience to the United Nations so that that can feed into future treaties, future voluntary guidelines, and just inform the debate. Again, the accords weren't developed to prevent or replace any kind of treaty. They were meant to ensure that we comply with the treaties that we have to abide by now, and then inform and even accelerate the debate and discussion to get, hopefully, global treaties in the future by not only moving forward with the accords, but hopefully other countries you know, implementing maybe even some different ways to achieve the goals of the Outer Space Treaty. And then hopefully we all come together in the United Nations, finding more common ground for future treaties and future norms of behavior. Thank you. I see our time. We have one more minute less left. So I just wanted to uh, take this moment again to thank our panelists and our moderator and to thank our audience for coming out today. Um, I cannot stress enough how thankful I am to have met every one of you and each and every one of you. Um, and at this time, this will conclude Albany Law Review's Volume 85 Symposium. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well done. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. To, to Thank you all. Thanks, Thank David. you so much, Thanks, David. And uh, I'll speak to some of you soon. Anyway, be well, all of you. Take care. So much fun. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.